fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got traction. He's got rhythm. Oh, he's got oh, 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 he's he's taken Anderson. Anderson's up there. Oh, my God. These guys are going to want to make their way through the field very quickly. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. That's massive. This is it. This is over. I can't believe this. Oh, my God. God, what? This is the original eSport racing game. This is iRacing. What an important season this one will prove to be. This, a season which runs from here, the start at one of Canada's great circuits to the home of American racing in forms of road emphasis. This is the genesis as we head all the way towards the end of the season, the road to Elkhart Lake. And for Australian sim racers, this is the pilgrimage. This is is the amalgamation of everything that has come before, come now, and will come after. For this is the Virtual Racing School V8 Supercars Online Premier Series here on the iRacing Esports Network. And we start with Super Split 2 action here from Montreal, Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, and the legendary track that, it's, that this one proves to be. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all over the world. I'm Jake Sperry, joined with Reese Gardner here in the commentary booth. And Reese, my goodness, what a track this proves to be. It is technical, it is fast, it has the slowing chicanes. And my goodness, this season, everyone is G'd up and ready to go. G'd up is right. Really been looking forward to this season getting going. Hello, everyone, on the iRacing Esports Network, on the V8 Scops Facebook page live stream, all across the internet. We are so hyped to bring this to you. And yes, Montreal, we went there for two 300-kilometer races last season. It was part of the Endurance Cup. But now, it's the opening round of the season. We've gone to the 250K format for Split 1. Only a 28-lap sprint for Split 2, though. So it's going to be an interesting one. It's going to be incredibly interesting, and it is one of those tracks where it's about pinpoint precision accuracy, and anything less than that can find you in one of these fabled walls here and there, which have proven to be very, very deadly over the course of racing action that we have seen over the years. Of course, last year this track proved to be a thrilling endurance level, but it became the season opener for this season going. But there are drivers up and down the field who maybe have a good shot and maybe some who have fallen under the radar. But let's head over to Simspeed Entertainment because the likes, the Flat Chat podcast, JC Richards, Christopher Kessie and Matthew Norris have been keeping an eye out on some of the drivers. Brenton Hobson is the driver of the 88 Synergy Sim Racing Commodore. It's a quite a nice paint job that they've got this year. It's very good. Newly stickered. Looks great. Uh, the undeniable YouTube star of the Scops series, Hobbo88, is always finishing sixth. And last year he managed to break that drought and finally grab a podium. So hopefully Hobbo's got a bit more left in him and he can push for the, a win in 2019. Another race winner. That's right, it's time for Wayne Burke. One Performance Racing has just moved over from Synergy Sim Racing, so we're really not sure how he's going to um, uh, adapt to his new team. Uh, we know that towards the end of last year, he definitely fired up, getting his first victory ever in uh, V8 Supercars Online Premier Series. And look, he, he has definitely got a lot of potential. Um, and look, 
I'm not really sure where to place him this year. I think maybe top 10. I think that's that's kind of where I would predict uh, where Wayne will finish this year. I'm looking forward to seeing how he goes. I think he, this is a specialist guy. He's specialist on some tracks. Um, I know that in Interlagos, this guy is an absolute weapon. So definitely watch out for him there. Um, but yeah, that's Wayne Burke for one performance racing. And here we have Dane Warren. Yes, Dane Warren. He's moved on from All-Star All Motorsport, who unfortunately closed down in the last season. And he has come to, in my opinion, uh, the team that is definitely going to bring, bring him his first victory. He's come so close over the last couple of years, but I really do think that this uh, budding Carter is going to do an awesome job this season with Altus. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to action that we've got. We're about under eight and a half minutes away now from the start of racing proceedings, but a new season has brought a whole lot of changes into the calendar. We've seen that some different races are going to be coming in. The likes of a to-be-announced race will be decided along with a driver's choice race later on in the season, but also new rule changes have come in and most notably what we have seen over the course of those new rule changes Reese, has been the addition of the safety car which is going to be piloted by Simon Mazomo and hopefully he will survive with his safety car um, and not end up like a certain Belle Isle safety car earlier this year. Yeah, certainly not. That safety car you can see on screen right now painted by Daniel Stevens won the little competition that we were holding for that one congratulations mr stevens awesome looking livery on that safety car for sure so mazomo is going to be manually piloting the safety car when one is called all throughout the season split one split two every single race he is going to be there and uh the drivers are going to have to watch out because uh, this safety car you can definitely crash into you certainly can and so mazomo will find himself with a lot that he'll be needing to do over the course of this event and He's got everything to understand about what sort of pace you've got to drive and how quickly you need to drive over the course of this race. But let's just talk about pre-qualification just for the moment here. It's a oh, new yeah. season, and my goodness, was it close. The top 52 drivers were split by one second in pre-qualification. Not only that, but the top 80 were only split by 1.4. So this is arguably the closest season we've ever had. Yeah, we've had over 162 drivers attempt pre-qualifying here, enough to make up for four splits of racing. A couple more stats for you. 17,542 laps of this circuit in total covered. An average of about 500 kilometers of distance covered per driver. And the amount of distance covered, 75,746 kilometers worth of distance. That's enough to go around the world a few more times. It is, and my goodness, we've seen great amount of effort that has come in on times, and everyone has been trying to make that push and trying to get themselves further forward and working to a level which they are capable of taking to the top. And a few drivers have found themselves in second split, maybe surprised that they find themselves in the second split, and knowing that they've got that only one magical ticket that comes along that beautiful ticket, Reese, which is, of course, the main dance and the racing action over 250 kilometers when it comes to the main event. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that was introduced last season. The winner of the split two race gets promoted to split one. They're allowed to take part in the main event. And uh, Ross Rizzo managed to do it at round one last season. Rizzo is down in split two for this one as well. He might be able to do it again. He very much could do. He, of course, got the victory at the opener last year at the Circuit Road Atlanta. So he certainly does have the opportunity to go out there and try to attempt that again. But life's not going to be easy around this circuit. Remember, there is one mandatory pit stop that will be required to be taken. So there are no guarantees that this one is ending in victory for anyone. And, of course, there is that very difficult turn one, turn two section, which has to be looked at every single time at this track which could go incredibly incredibly wrong 
Yeah, absolutely. Montreal, it's a, it's a circuit that's seemingly at odds with itself. Uh, as, I, as I've said in the past, it's fast and flowing, but tight and twisty at the same time. It's a purpose-built racetrack that's built in the middle of public parkland, and the public can cycle on it any time they like throughout the year when it's not closed off for a race weekend. It's got big curves, it's got chicanes, it's got huge flow and fantastic character. This is a circuit that uh, that everyone uh, has fallen in love with since it got onto iRacing, but it carries its own quirks. We've seen multiple times in the past, iRacing's automated uh, track cut penalty system uh, that ensures you don't uh, gain advantages for cutting the track. It's pretty brutal here. You overrun those curves, you, you overshoot the last chicane, etc. Your lap, your race is going to be basically ruined. So the drivers have to be especially careful around this circuit. Oh my goodness, they do. And there is so much that they need to be very, very cautious of over the course of this race. We've seen how things can go wrong, even in a Formula One perspective. Who can remember Jensen Button in 2011? Two safety cars, or oh, six safety cars, twice to the back of the field, damaged all the rest of it, and he still managed to win the race. So this track does throw the unusual and the incapable around this place. But Reese, there are a few big overtaking opportunities in these big hulking V8 supercars. Where are they going to be looking to try and push the envelope out? Probably the earliest. The the most obvious spot on the track for overtaking is the hairpin, lipping the, the, the hairpin uh, down at the far end of the circuit. Um, so that seems fairly obvious, but you've also got places like the, uh, the last couple of turns that we're seeing uh, this car come up to now, this chicane. Cody Bircher for One Performance Racing through that chicane over those, wow, my goodness. That's what happens when you take a bit too much curb and uh, you can easily fit two cars side by side on the entry. If you manage to get one up the inside, you have to yield. But uh, Guy Leach here for KRF Motorsports demonstrating the hairpin, which is the place you're probably going to see most moves being made. Absolutely fantastic to see out on track and well that's going to be probably the place where we're going to be seeing most of the moves being done it's about a setup game here at Gilles Villeneuve and this is what we're looking at a few drivers have been pushing the envelope out they've been trying to work out where it is that they're going to be making that charge how they've been attacking other drivers maybe they haven't had the chance to do so in pre-qualification but there is one final little bit which does seem to catch out a few drivers more often than not and reese that is a wall made for champions yeah it certainly is at the exit of that last chicane you just saw brenton hobson go past it there on the screen the wall of champions at the exit of the final chicane very easy to uh, swing the rear out on exit and give that wall a whack or if you overshoot the chicane you're going to just go straight for it so the drivers do have to be extremely alert when going around this circuit it's not the only uh, dangerous wall around this place though you pretty much have them at every single corner that's the kind of circuit we're talking about here yeah and it's that sort of circuit that we are starting to see Drivers just getting ready for we are under two minutes away and soon a one minute warning We will find ourselves in the top five in practice Guy Leach, Lee Ellis, Carl James, Ryan O'Sullivan and Bradley Ratu at this stage So these drivers maybe at the front have a lot of pace Maybe those drivers towards the back will just be playing that waiting game will be looking and going well, okay, let's just sit down, let's just relax and try and wait to see what's going to happen for us in the long term of this one. 28 laps is, in theory, a long time, and these drivers understand that, especially with the IndyCar-style pit entries and exits, that we're going to have all grid stalls will be used, or all pit box stalls will be used over the course of this one. But now is where you have to put your money where your mouth is, Reese, and it is winner picking time for Super Split 2. Yeah, absolutely is. This is going to be an awesome one. And uh, Split 2 really threw up some exciting events last year. Hopefully 2019 brings us exactly the same. Uh, of course, Guy Leach, as you said, on top here in the, uh, in the Split timesheets. And we've only got a few seconds left until we tick over into this race session. Grid spots decided by pre-qualifying times grid spots were decided by pre-qualification and we will just get that up on the grid for you right about 
Nah. Starting on pole position then will be Ross Rizzo with Lee Ellis alongside Brenton Hobson. Hobbo 88 starts from third with Liam Wilde in fourth. It's Cody Bircher and Greg Sharp on row three. Row four is Ryan O'Sullivan and Jamie McKnight. Yeah, Mitchell Sealak and Bradley Ratu rounding out the top 10 there. Mark Newton and Kyle James on row six. Row seven is Jacob Knight and Andrew Fraser. New Zealand Sim Racing's Kane Hewson in 15th. The top 16 rounded out by Luke Page. Thomas Hins, Guy Leach, David Sanford and Riley Blythe. The top 20, Damian Johnstone, Dylan Shepard, David Kinman and Christopher Kessie round out 24. The rest getting themselves up on the grid. As things stands at the moment, the pace, though, is very firmly behind Ross Rizzo, and the rest will now look to chase behind with everything that is going to go on. Welcome to the dawn of a brand new season, and welcome to Circuit Gilles Villeneuve V8 Scots Super Blitz 2 is green and let's get underway here a very good start there from lee ellis on the outside trying to make that run on the outside to turn number one it's well defended as they will concertina up into the left right chicane as they try and navigate for a way through all fine through the first 20 vehicles at the moment there's a bit of a checkup though in the middle of the pack a bit of contact to go with that was around the uh brenton o'brien sort of era Kessie sort of line that we've been seeing into turn number three they go and there's contact in the background oh. around they're gonna go and oh it's gonna be messy and three four five get themselves caught up i think the safety car may just have to be called for that one just blocking itself up we do stay green for the moment but there we see a little bit of argy bargy in the early goings yeah certainly the likes of uh, jacob knight thomas hins andrew fraser safety and mark car. newton involved in that the safety car is out. So Simon Mazomo out there on the track. There was actually a further incident. Damon Mulqueen spinning in the turn after that. So no overtaking allowed now. Drivers are going to have to slow themselves up. And that is uh, Stephen Varga, unfortunately. That brand new Redback Racing Team livery getting more than a few scuffs on it. That's Mulqueen there. Uh, a lot of drivers having big issues on that first lap. Yeah, huge issues that we've seen. And there is a lot of damage, but after half a lap's worth of racing, it's going to be the safety car that will come out for the very first time. And Simon Mazomo will make sure to get that one off and going again in this beautiful uh, Oceanic Sim Racing Sim Speed safety car that they will have available to them. So Ross Rizzo will round the final corner. And well, here's the first laps going to be led for Simon Mazomo here in this event and will have complete control over the pace of the field so your field after one lap then will look as follows in this one it is ross rizzo who holds the lead out in this one lee ellis will start second or is in second brenton hobson third cody bircher has plus one in fourth liam wilde has lost one in fifth position greg sharp sixth rhino sullivan seventh and jamie mcknight rounds out the top eight your big gainer at the moment inside your field is scott larnick he's gained 13 positions from that first lap melee big thanks to modem simulation for uh, coming in as the sponsor of our replays for this season you just saw uh going over those lap one incidents again big unfortunate incidents for people throughout the field but once again thank you very much to modem simulation Yes, Bradley Ratu uh, holding for pretty consistent in the top 10. Uh, the likes of Dylan Shepard, I think, have come off very well from this as well. And Scott Larnack, too. He started outside the top 30, the TTL Esports driver. Now he's up to 19th. Yeah, he's had a very, very good start. But there are drivers who do have a bit of damage out on track. Kane Hewson is one of them without that rear... Uh, that rear boot that he's got he will be struggling a little bit for grip and performance he's got riley blythe just behind who's gained four places and that won't be too helpful in the long and short of things so drivers will have to be careful dylan shepherd himself up eight positions off the start of this one so he's having a very good run on how this start has gone but it is still the trick that is ross rizzo leading this field and this slowing down of the pack it's going to be very useful on one big thing here today, and that is fuel consumption. Yes, indeed. Speaking of fuel consumption, Britton Hobson has got the clutch in and uh, is really saving fuel behind the safety car. Listen to it. 
almost no sound coming off that engine at all there. So Brenton is thinking about the long game in this one. He certainly is thinking about that long game. And while he's got really no other alternatives for that, he's wanting to try and save as much as possible. There is no uh, necessarily issues that there are going to be have. Pit lane is closed at this stage at the moment. Pit lane is very much uh, off limits in the early stages, but it will be this next lap where we expect pit road to be declared open and drivers may come down in and make that stop. And I'm wondering here, if you're incredibly brave and you're a little bit further back down in the pack, whether it's worth coming down in, making that stop, getting back onto the train and then pushing for however many laps is left and trying to hold on with that fuel number. I'm not sure they can do it, but we've seen over the course of last season, it gets incredibly close. Yeah, it feels to me like it'd be a bit early to go in for a pit stop at this rate. Remember, the race is 20, uh, 28 laps long, so do need to to keep that in mind we'll have to we'll have to wait and see though we've seen stranger things happen pit lane exit has now been opened as everyone has gone by so that's going to mean that everyone will be able to come down in make their stop get fresh tires get themselves uh, some fuel that they so desperately desperately need and they were all going to have to just play this game of being patient and making sure that everything is going to work out and the end of the lap is going to be going to be uh, going. So lights effectively off on top of the safety car, we could say. Ross Rizzo is in control. So we have just seen a little uh, nuance here of the change of the rules. The fact that you cannot come in during that safety car period. And as such, on lap four, Ross Rizzo will be out and away and going to try and make this work in his favor. So we'll see how this one's going to work out for him as he goes through. But Reese. My goodness, Ross Rizzo, he's got a little bit of work right now at this stage as the pace car now pulls away. Yes, indeed. So, Rizzo, he's, uh, he's shown winning ways before, but uh, this is going to be a bit of a big ask for him with the likes of, uh, of the Ellison company behind him. I would keep a lookout for the likes of Britton Hobson and Cody Bircher, see what they can do pack is slowing down here and uh, we are getting ready to go green once again here at Montreal. I'm excited. I'm excited as well. Still paced behind Ross Rizzo who will be very, very patient in that Trick Sim Sport machine trying to wait as late as possible through the final chicane he'll go and Lee Ellis is still trying to think about when do I go. Rizzo leaves it a little late but he Good does jump. catch Ellis off guard. Great jump by Brenton Hobson as well. He's going to try and go. No overtaking before the start finish line. Brian O'Sullivan now looks to get aggressive down the inside of Greg Sharp for sixth position and he slightly overcooks it. Bit of a oh. shot to the back as well and manages to hold it all together. A little bit of contact in the background there as well as McKnight and Cholak decide they want to go at it but we're good we're green we're racing again at Montreal yeah we are but how long because look at Seolak and McKnight getting very close quarters there the back of the field still coming through the chicane it seems pretty single file further down in the pack so that's good to see it's on at the moment for second third and fourth though Cody Birch a big oversteer moment coming out of the previous turn and Rizzo hasn't dropped Ellis and Hobson as much as he probably would want. Goodness me, Hobson, big oversteer moment. That's going to leave him open to Bircher at the hairpin. Yeah. We might see a couple of moves. We definitely could. And well, is he going to go down to the inside? No is the option. Lee Ellis opens up the door on, uh, on uh, Ross Rizzo. He doesn't quite get it behind oh, that. So I know Sullivan's on the move and he's just banzai one down the inside of Liam Wilde and Wilde yields for that trying to get the draft away but Ross Rizzo is not safe here. Lee Ellis is going to try and chase that gap down and try and get as much as possible going through. Bradley Ratu and Jamie McKnight also in their own little scraps as they head to the final chicane for the first time in green flag running conditions and they are all safely clean through in the front eight. McKnight though has got Ratu and now Carl James getting in on that and Carl James looked fantastic in practice and it's now searching for a move into one, and it was slightly defended. Yeah, it certainly was. You have a look at Ratu, they're still going defensive. James trying to squeeze one up the inside. Great on board shot there. A new livery for the Redback boys. 
awesome looking machine out there right now. Have a look at this further back in the field though. Goodness me, side by side, Scott O'Keefe, SDC Motorsports versus Damian Johnston there. Bruce Kiley up at the front of that pack, just um, observing his mirrors, having a look at the show. Yes, and it's a big show. Johnston, O'Keefe, Tom Freer in the hyperdrive car. Todd Parks, Dion Peters, Lance Perkins, Benjamin Smith, Andrew Fraser, Mark Newton, all in this pack that goes all the way down to 30th position. And just finding some breathing space, I think, will be very good for those who are looking to try and push. Dylan Shepard, who was someone on the move, is now looking for 12th position now. Guy Leach is the next victim on the hit list. And will he find a chance down the inside? He's going to look at it. There's a little look further front as well, as I believe that's Shane McKnight in his scrap. And through there goes uh, Dylan Shepard. He gets the one that he wants. Greg Sharp loses out to Cholak, who's now he himself starting to move. The top five now start to splinter. Yes, indeed. Oh, my goodness. David Sanford. That was a big incident back down there in the pack. David Sanford and Scott Larnack coming together with the wall. And Brenton O'Brien has been forced to really check up there. He's pushing Larnack ahead there at the moment. Goodness me. That's one way to solve that little dilemma. Bump. That's the best way forward. Little check up, though, coming off of the exit. And O'Brien nearly gets a piece of Stanford. And Kane Houston now is going to go uber to the inside, trying to find a move into turn number one. He gets one. Don't tell me you're going to go for the park. Oh, he slowed it up. What a check up. But he may just get nothing for the fans I move because coming back at him is Sanford trying to get on this one. 71 looking for the inside. And can he make this oh. one work? Sideways moment going through turn three. And he'll lose it and bang into the arm card. Ouch. That's bad for Kane Hughes in there. But that, that was a battle for the last couple of positions in the top 20. That really says it all about the racing in this series. It's super intense no matter where you look down the field. We're well, looking back up at the front, though. It still hasn't uh, spread out as much as we thought it would. No, no surprises there at all. Ryan O'Sullivan is the fastest car, though, in the field, and he's been checking and chasing down this front pack. And now he's there. Little check up there from Ross Rizzo as they all try and slide away through. Side by side, they go through Jane McKnight on the outside. As through will go Bradley Ratu, picking up a position just behind that, though. Oh, big battle as Shepard gets himself a full mirror of Riley Blythe, trying to find a way through Luke Page there with David Kinman as well so everyone's trying to find themselves a bit of a battle defensive line taken by Bradley Ratu and oh there was a look to the inside from Jane McKnight but he had no confidence on the brakes no certainly not taking a look at um a guy Leach there as he was attempting to chase down Blythe a little bit of space being left on the outside but uh these guys oh my goodness oh, the, the 043 car goodness still in Shepard oh that's big contact very big contact and Guy Leach has been forced wide there. Quite a bit of contact happening and that has shuffled around a few positions to say the least. Oh, they were three wide. Luke Page was there. David Kinman and Dylan Shepard were getting involved. They all came together. Ooh, they all Ooh. survived. And now we look at James here at the moment, who's got his own train here at Kinman and Blythe that he's got to try and rest away and try and worry about. But no chance into five and six. It's about trying to work off to the very difficult 7-8 chicane, which is arguably the most difficult one out on circuit. So easy to overshoot and get that wrong. A lot slower you need to be as Hobson gets a little wiggle in third position now as Cody Bircher maybe could be lining up this move as they're starting to fall off slightly. Bevelis and Rizzo at the front here and Ryan O'Sullivan's got to feel he's got to go against the one performance car and at the moment it seems that Evolution Racing Team are pushing. Here comes Ryan O'Sullivan trying to get into the ball. Yes indeed. So uh, you were just looking at on screen there uh, a couple other battles uh, getting decided there. Riley Blythe going for the move just slightly. But uh, Ryan O'Sullivan, the pressure is definitely on for him here. Coming through the uh, the last chicane for the seventh time. O'Sullivan, you can see he's really starting to put the pressure on Bircher in front. And these guys, I think they're going to trip over themselves sooner rather than later. O'Sullivan will pick up the pieces. Yeah, and that's what they've got to worry about is how are we going to fight? Because look at the times that they were doing. 36-5 that last time by from Brenton Hobson. He's now nine-tenths of a second. 
off of Lee Ellis here in second place in the 18, who did a 36-2. So lost three tenths. The gap's now nine tenths of a second. But he's not getting the draft coming through to the section of the final chicane. He's going to be in a world of hurt come the end of this event. So Ross Rizzo at the moment now starting to see that pack fragment. He was worrying about five. Now he's only worrying about one. Oh, goodness me, Ryan O'Sullivan. That was a big oversteer moment. And that's a section of the track where it's very easy to get an oversteer moment. Another Motum simulation replay for you all right now. Take a look at O'Sullivan through this chicane section. Just getting on the throttle. Almost at full throttle by this point. But oh, just catching the grass. Almost uh, losing it, but not quite. Not quite at all. Riley Blythe at the moment. He's in this scrap with Kyle James. This the 13th position at the moment on the road and on the brakes no opportunities to make the move and they are starting to hit the pit stop window behind that though big lunge down the inside from david kinman and kinman will comfortably find a way by on scott larnock but larnock can get the overspeed back off of the exit here and make that run all the way to the chicane and maybe there is a chance of getting that move goes to the inside trying to make that happen will there have to be a yield and they're gonna go at it too wide there's the yield and that is a comfortable move down through but pick it up off the exit heavy application of curb here comes luke page into the battle yes indeed luke page uh, much better exit than kinman obviously kinman was trying to line up a good exit but wasn't able to not able to get by and just coming out of the pits um alongside all of these guys is Andy Sim in uh, Synergy Sim Racing livery. I think the, one of the first drivers to take a pit stop. Four laps down though. So he's yes, just gotten so some damage repaired from, uh, from that lap one incident. No surprises there. So he's managed to get back out and going. Cody Bircher though is starting to be dropped by Hobson. And now this allows Ryan O'Sullivan to now start playing the aggressive factor. And they know that there is points for the second split but they want to get to split number one because they can add more points on by having a very solid and strong drive Ryan O'Sullivan looking to try and get this one down the inside it's not quite there to be able to do it but look at this picks it up off the exit trying they're almost touching each other the way how close they were and still not quite what they want but still Lee Ellis trying to get himself towards Ross Rizzo as well in the battle at the front but look at O'Sullivan he's pulling alongside looking for fourth position can he get the move sorted on the brakes down the inside and position taken nicely done there from ryan o'sullivan great move you can see the car was very twitchy but he was able to use it to his advantage there his next target is going to be uh brenton hobson just up ahead i tell you what it's really closed up for the lead because ellis is right on the back of rizzo now yeah, and well, the Lee Ellis fan club can start smiling at the way that he's been driving. He's worked well over this one as we have just seen maybe a little bit of yeah. uh, aggression that we've got right now. And well, Greg this Sharp. one here is, is Greg Sharp that we're looking at and he has uh, got himself maybe a little bit further back and he just went straight on at turn number one and two and he had to take to the escape road and serve the slowdown. Yes, indeed, that's a real shame. Uh, just misjudging the braking point behind that other car there. So yeah, he's been able to get back onto the track, which is good, but still not optimal for him at all. That top two battle, though, I think that is one of the places where it's really at on track right now. We ride on board with Mitchell Sealak as he chases down Liam yeah, Wilde. Yeah, goodness me, O'Sullivan, what? He's just gotten up into third. There we go. He's just sliding on by. And he comes out of that third chicane massive run off the exit had to lift off there did Hobson because he was going to tap the wall but just like that Rhino Sullivan up into third and he's got two seconds to chase down now to get to Lee Ellis who's just backing off of things a little bit here as they head into the right left chicane and ultimately looking to try and get as aggressive as possible still no takers here lap 10 of 28 you normally see two thirds distance but here's Guy Leach oh my goodness me off goes Jamie McKnight bang into the arm go he caught the ball on the outside and a massive massive breaking moment and he gets speared up sideways yeah and he's now right now attempting to get into the pit lane so we're going to have to take a look at this modem replay what happened to mcknight just coming down the back straight with a zuba car behind him 
So what on earth happened? Was this a botched move? No, McKnight lost it on his own into the wall and then smash right into the tire barrier. Good thing he was close to the pit lane. He was able to get it in there rather quickly. Yes, he was able to survive at that stage. Got another little battle going on a little bit further down as Stephen Varga, um, who is four laps down, looks to try and get past a few uh, vehicles here and there. But we've still got ourselves that battle at the front of the field that we can continue to put our focus on at the moment. Ross Rizzo and Lee Ellis. Lee just playing that patience game. Maybe had a half look down the inside there. Wasn't able to make that happen, but they have to be worried about Ryan O'Sullivan. He's pushing hard at the moment, and the big worry from this race is going to be how can Ryan O'Sullivan deal with the tyres? He took four tenths of a second off last lap, and I'm sure he'll be able to do that continuously over the next few laps, and he's dragging Hobson and Bircher with him. Yeah, definitely seems that way. Hobson and Bircher... Uh, it's, it's a good position they're in, actually. Yes, they may have just been overtaken by a faster guy, but now they can use the slipstream. They can save a bit of fuel behind them as well, which could help them when it comes to the pit stop time. Ellis still pressuring Rizzo massively, though. This is this is a really good drive from Ellis, I have to say. He's, uh, he's fallen off the radar a little bit in recent Scott seasons. We haven't talked about him as much as we used to, but, uh, but Lee is really showing what he can do in this one, pressuring Rizzo for this lead. The top seven are all split under four seconds. That goes all the way back to Mitchell Cholak and Liam Wilde, who have been very quiet over the course of this one. Big slide from the one performance car. Bircher gets all shades of wrong, and now he will cause a two-tone shift in this battle. He will fall backwards into the clutches of Wilde and Cholak, and that's not what he would have been wanting because he's now got to play a very long and crafty game from here as they now push through that second chicane over to the hairpin on lap 12. Surely the pit stop window will have to come from one of these drivers. They can't all decide to come in at the same time again. Ellis eyeing up that inside, trying to get in the mirrors, and it's a complete different shift on oh, how Bircher. they attack that exit. And Bircher again running a little bit wide, maybe overheating those tyres slightly there, Reese is now you can also see he's got a bit of damage on the front right as well. Yeah, well, what ended up happening there was Bircher actually caught the grass on the entry to the hairpin. That's what sent him wide. So now he's under big pressure from Wild. Bircher having to go defensive here. Oh, a little oh, bit of contact. Oh, and Bircher's forced to go all the way across the chicane there, as is Wild. They're both going to lose out massively from that one. Redressing, I think both of them want to redress and they can't do anything so they'll stay too wide as they make their way to one and they're going to get oh. mighty close again. Oh, this was not what they wanted but Bircher does decide to hold on against Liam Wild. Both now fall behind Brad Ratu and that's a lot of time that has been lost in this one. But look at Lee Ellis now. Ryan O'Sullivan's the man on the move and right now there is a rocket called Ronnie but at the moment that rocket's got Ryan written all over it. It absolutely has. Have a look at how close he is to Lee now. In fact, I think uh, I think Ellis actually dropping back from Rizzo slightly lost two tenths on him on the uh, on the last lap. So O'Sullivan's really capitalising out of this one. Sullivan's last lap of 36.423, and that was four tenths faster than Rizzo. We're going to get a quick motion replay here of uh, Jacob Knight, I believe. Um, what on earth happened to him? I see a bit of smoke. He's just uh, going straight into the pits there. Huh. I, oh, goodness me. That was a fairly botched entry. I think that can uh, definitely be said. But uh, very unfortunate for Knight. That's some valuable time that he would have lost. Just locking it. Goodness me, yeah, right the into the wall. Yeah, right in the tires as well, and that was never going to be helpful. Who decides to jump? Lap 13 here of 28, and Brenton Hobson is the first to dive. He decides it's time to hit pit road, and followed by Brad Ratu as well, who gets oh, all shades of around on pit road, and he will hit reverse incredibly quickly, and he'll look for his box backwards as he J turns it, almost gets it right, and tries to get going again. Well, 10 for ingenuity, zero for application. Unfortunately, we don't give out style points in VH Scops, so um, I, th I think Ratu might have missed out a little bit there. <laughs> he may have done, but oh, it's so easy to get wrong. Of course, it's a rear wheel drive vehicle. He just locked the axle there, Reese, and just like that, bang, it's around and you're a passenger at that point. 
Yeah, that's it. Remember, these these cars have a locked differential. They don't have uh, they don't have as advanced of a, of a setup as most race cars do. So the drivers do have to be careful with how they treat the rear. Ryan O'Sullivan, though, right on the back of Lee Ellis once again. The top three is incredibly close. They that's your top three in the frame right there. And uh, Ellis, all right exit from that chicane, but O'Sullivan has really been strong up at this latter half of the circuit. You can see both of them are twitching massively coming into the hairpin. Oh, and you can see through the hairpin, Ryan O'Sullivan is absolutely on it, but it's coming off of that hairpin where he needs to find that run. And the Evolution Racing Team, which has had a massive, massive boost to its V8 successes when we talk about top split, and we'll do that in after this event. But there was a little half look going down through. Oh, oh that's not no! Oh, no, that's not good at all. Lee Ellis goes into oh. the front of Ross Rizzo. Miscommunication, and that's why this is one of the most dangerous pit roads to go in on. Oh my goodness. Well, that's just completely ruined the top three battle right there. And it just goes to show Montreal's pit entry. Goodness me. Rizzo was slowing down for the chicane, but Ellis was trying to go for the pit entry right into the back. And I think race control are going to have a long, hard look at that. Well, it's going to be a massive look, and this has completely shaken everything up. And guess who's the big beneficiary in all of this? It's oh, Brenton yeah. Hobson, who has come in early and one lap early. And here he is making his way through the final corner. And now on the front stretch, he'll go. I wonder right now, will he be in the right position? Or I know Sullivan, though, should come out in first. And he has got that gap by a couple of seconds. So O'Sullivan now takes over. Cholak is a big gainer in this as well. Yeah, he certainly is. Sialak um, gaining quite uh, a huge amount from that one. O'Sullivan now behind Dion Peters as they come through this uh, twisty section of the circuit. O'Sullivan going by into this chicane. So Peters in a very awkward position here. He is carrying some damage and uh, he is right in the midst of what is becoming the top three battle here. Yes, and that much has to be said. Drivers who have yet to come down in, Cody Bircher, Liam Wilde, Guy Leach, Dylan Shepard, Luke Page, Brenton O'Brien in a scrap right now with the CMR team car of uh, Benjamin Smith. And, well, team boss Brenton O'Brien does get a good exit compared to that uh, Benjamin Smith car. And, well, he just can't quite get it done. Now, looking a little bit further back, there's Brenton Hobson just trying to make the way through on Dion Peters. Peters gets a big wiggle through that small kink left. Doesn't seem like much, but that torque oversteer comes into play, and Brenton Hobson zooms on by. Yes, indeed he does. He's already uh, gone well on by. We're taking another look at the pit stop here because Cody Bircher is now in the pits. Peters goes into the pits. There's only two cars in this... There's one car in the field that is left to take the mandatory pit stop. So Hobson going to go on by Liam Wilde assuming the lead of the race but he of course has yet to pit and also Benjamin Smith uh, Benjamin Smith still needs to come in and make the stop that he needs to he's pitted twice already here in this event but he will still need a little bit more but Liam Wilde at the moment currently holds control he's had a quiet run in this race he hasn't been too aggressive i don't think so it's just got to be very cautious about that slow is gary cooper left him through as now hobson gets under pressure from Sholak here in this battle for net second on the road yes indeed net second this is quite the entertaining one hobson and sealak on screen at the moment coming into the chicane there's o'sullivan right there just in front of them Oh, have a look at how aggressive Hobson's being with the curbs. He's very confident in that car right now, but he knows that Sealak is bearing down on him very aggressively. Sealak gaining over three tenths in just the last few corners. So that TTL driver's a man on a mission. Will he be able to get a good exit? Not right now, but they still have the draft to come up here. Tell you what, this race is absolutely flying by. We're almost at two-thirds distance. We certainly are lap 16 here of 28, turning to 17. In the next few moments, no move from Cholak. He's going to have to wait for a different opportunity. And then Cholak's going to have to try and look to get to Rhino Sullivan. Two-wheel action 
from Brenton Hobson. Horbo, 88, was nearly doing 88s when it came to his tyres. So now on the brakes they go into one and two. Hobson a lot more calm and composed and being really aggressive with those curves. But this is going to be the issue. Hobbo's being so aggressive here, I think he's going to use all his tyres before Cholak it. Yeah, possibly. You can see Cholak looks a little bit more controlled. Oh, oh just as I say that, there he goes. And that's going to be a slowdown penalty for him. That's going to be a bit more of the tyre worn away that he would have used. And he's hit the wall again. Uh, just glanced off it just as we go to this motion replay. Looks like Sealak just uh, just locked the rears. Let's have a look on board. Was there a bit of contact? No. Sealak just lunged forward and the car just went out from under him. It certainly did. And well, there's not much that Cholak can do. He's maybe just had a bit of grass on his tires that he had to try and uh, wipe off and he hasn't got much in terms of respite because there's a ross and a rizzo just there trying to get back into this event even with the damaged boots that he has on his vehicle he's still in the hunt if he wants to try and get through but look at how hobson has attacked over the last stage of this one because ryan o'sullivan has certainly dropped a lot of time i wonder if he actually got caught going over the curb a bit too aggressively and he's had to serve a slow down penalty sure did look like it from my perspective yeah. all of a sudden brenton hobson's in this one for a race victory yep exactly i just went back myself sperry i saw ryan o'sullivan lift off out of that uh, previous chicane so that's a big dent in his race and it's like a switch has been flicked for Brenton Hobson. He has really switched himself on now. Look at him right on the back of O'Sullivan through these first couple of turns. He has got to make sure that he makes the right call because there are two, three, maybe even four behind who will look to take advantage. Liam Wilde has come back out after his stop. He is behind Cody Bircher in sixth place. So this race far from over for those at the front of the field. The top six still within seven seconds and Brad Ratu currently in seventh. Battle for the top ten though. Guy Leach and Scott Larnock going at it at the moment. Guy Leach has himself maybe a good opportunity to head through this next section. If he can just get on that outside track, can he make a push down the inside? But great application of defense there from Larnock. He held off very well. Yeah, very good defending from Larnack, just going right into the middle of the road, making sure that Leach didn't have anywhere productive to go. But that might change coming into this next chicane. Leach, you can see, obviously having the pace advantage here, having another look up the inside of Larnack, just having to go offline slightly. More than anything, he's probably hoping for a slowdown penalty. Dylan Shepard right behind these two. He wants to get in on this as well. He certainly does, and Dylan Shepard has been one of the big movers in this field. He's gone from 22nd to 12th, up 10 places, but Scott Larnock take nothing away from him. Up 22 to get this going. A little bit of side-by-side, -side, a little bit further down, because there's Riley Blight finally dispatching of Dave Kinman, but he's still not got it off of the exit. He had all sorts of oversteer problems on power throttle on the exit, and here is Luke Page in the background too. So Kinman now a thinking, run. do I go to the inside? No, he's got to do it the long way around. And I think Riley Blythe's got nothing here to fight back with. But he's got so much later on the brakes. A good 10 meters he got as he gets heavy over the first curb. But still, Kinman fights back. Yeah, and Blythe immediately going defensive once again. This is going to give him the inside line for turn one. You can see there's a lot of straight line speed that Blythe has lost, but he's putting all his faith into how fast his car stops. And Kinman knows that. He's pulled out of that one, and it's really becoming a bit of a dilemma here for Luke Page. He's got these two drivers battling really hard in front of him. Meanwhile, Dylan Shepard just gone off the track, and he has dropped off the back of that battle for 10th place. He has, and that was a mistake of his own accord, pushing a little bit too hard, but that battle for 10th is soon to be ninth as Guy Leach gets a big wiggle and survives to tell the tale because they have both caught Greg Sharp, who is still in this one, mind you, so keep an eye on this as the battle for the lead intensifies between Hobson and O'Sullivan. O'Sullivan taking that wider line, trying to make that push forward, and he's ultimately got himself a gap for another day but Hobson has just been playing that waiting game got out and did everything he needed oh, to do contact oh. contact at the hairpin big contact Greg Sharp Guy Leach and Scott Larnack all coming together Sperry oh, oh. Well, it was Larnack going through and bang there was contact two bits of contact and well I believe that is uh, Greg Sharp who's effectively uh, noped himself out of this one redressing the issue and letting everyone through with 
very heavy damage. I think his day is going to be done. But bang, one contact, bang, two. Guy Leach has too much damage. He can't continue on this one. Dylan Shepard now fights Larnock for ninth place. Yes, indeed. We have a modem replay of that incident as uh, Larnak and Shepard will continue fighting on track. You just see um, Larnak just went straight into the back of Sharp. That sent him wide. And uh, unfortunately, Guy Leach just caught into that. This is a proper view of what happened. Larnak, you could sense he had overshot. He was trying to go for the inside line, but knocked Sharp around. And then... Uh, Guy Leach, unfortunately, having to take a bit of a detour across the inside. And Sharp, oh my goodness, that's a lot of steering in. <laughs> that is a massive amount of steering input, and that showed you just how devastated that uh, suspension was. Battle for the lead, though, still happening. Hobson again, not in a position to attack into the hairpin at Lepangle. And he's now got to try and find himself a good charge up through this section. He's been probably the weakest around this part of the track it's the first half of the track i think hobson is showcasing that he's got the pace and if he can't do it well mitchell cholak's only 1.1 seconds behind and the 03 can start getting aggressive here as we will have eight laps to go at the line yes indeed ryan o'sullivan wiggling a little bit in the braking zone for that last chicane so you can see that he's really set this car up with an aggressive front end it's really helped him make his way up to the front of the field as uh, we have word from race control that Scott Larnack has been given a drive-through penalty for that contact with Greg Sharp. A shame. And that is a little bit of a shame, but Dylan Shepard won't know that and will have to go aggressive if he wants to get by. So for the moment at least, Larnack, you can see, just holding a good line through the middle of the road to make sure that it was a do-or-die move for Dylan Shepard and he chose do and he did not choose die come the end so good sensible driving option there from Dylan Shepard he's waiting for the right moment to strike but now it is a train of three at the front of the field and Cholak probably looks the best of the lot here Rhino Sullivan has been struggling Cholak did a 35-9 on that last time by took half a second out your race leader Wow, awesome stuff. And Hobson has messed up the exit of that chicane. So that's giving Sealak a really good motivation to get by these guys. Awesome pace from him right now into the 35s, as you said. Almost going for an over-under at the exit of the hairpin. But uh, that, that hairpin with a wide exit, you can really uh, hook it up on the outside and get some good traction. Hobson's been able to do that. But now I think... Um, O'Sullivan is breathing a bit of a sigh of relief. Yeah, that sigh of relief, though, is a few tenths of a second, and he'll be hoping that Cholak cannot find a way past Hobson, but Hobson gets a great run through the final corner and can now start turning defense into offense, and that's what he'll be looking to try and do. Instead of worrying about Cholak behind, he's got to try and get on that aggressive factor and start harassing Ryan O'Sullivan if he wants to try and win this race. Still no chance off of the exit, though, and he struggles slightly, but they all have to be worried about how much they are going to be checking up in this one because Ross Rizzo will happily sit and wait for if anything happens like a Ross Rizzo incident as Lana comes in to serve his drive through. Yes indeed so that's a free position there for Dylan Shepard. We take a look at Cody Bircher and Liam Wild on screen at the moment. These guys battling for fifth place on the track at the moment and uh, it is getting mighty close between these two. Remember Bircher was one of the people fighting for the top three early on so he's a bit out of where he should uh, I guess supposed to be but uh, Wild really looking to make good on his event two tenths faster on the last one compared to Bircher yeah two tenths quicker then from Liam Wild and he'll be using that as emphasis to push and to attack and off goes Brenton Hobson and that one is oh. I think going to be for a redress potentially uh, no it's not so uh, it seems that uh, there was a long slowdown from Cholak, who lost a lot of time and actually uh, serving his slowdown uh, got put behind Ross Rizzo. And here's Ross Rizzo looking for second position and he's not going to find it. So a slowdown for Cholak. Hobson runs wide at the hairpin and all of a sudden Ryan O'Sullivan, uh, he seems he's hit the jackpot because he's got himself a couple seconds of breathing room. Yeah, and he's only got six laps to go here. So that's uh, that's optimal for our race leader at the moment but these guys all fighting for second will be absolutely ruining those last couple of corners of action 
and uh, Sealak especially, he was struggling with the rear end on the exit of turn one. The battle for fifth though, between Bircher and Wild, they both got something to gain there. Hobson and Rizzo, meanwhile. Yes, and Ross Rizzo is trying to get back into this and he's hoping that he's got a shot at making sure that second position at least can be his. It will be a great recovery if he can because he was absolutely torpedoed and there should be no way that his vehicle survive. He managed to get on the lane, the crew managed to get a few repairs in and suddenly he's still in this race and he is wrestling with that trick sim sport car and it seems those crews have had a trick up their sleeve one or another good battling a little bit further down in the pack as well because damien johnstone is trying to battle out with david sanford this one is all the way back in 15th position at the moment and they're having their own very good race yeah they certainly are johnstone in 15th sanford in 16th and sanford one of the many drivers in v8 scops today who find themselves newly privateers because the news came out shortly uh in uh, in early february that uh all Star Motorsports had folded, unfortunately, uh, after losing a few of their fastest guys to other teams. Um, All Star elected to shut their doors. So the dr drivers like David Sanford and Marie Hrushka, Nathan Connor, Brock Caddy, they have all decided to go the privateer route for the next few months. Sanford is really doing well, though, battling for 16th here with, uh, sorry, 15th with Johnson. Yeah, he's having that really good battle as we now hit five laps to go here at Montreal. The battle for second as Hobson gets another little wiggle coming out through three and four. Long ride to five into the six, seven chicane comes along. And well, still Ross Rizzo is the epitome of calmness at the moment behind his vehicle certainly no issues at all with the way that he's been driving it's more uh, throw everything on the wall from Brenton Hobson and Hobbo 88 is still unable even in split two to seemingly break his wind up as he runs wide that will be a slowdown penalty surely gets a big kick up off the exit and here will come Ross Rizzo looking to the outside to try and make this move on Hobson I wonder will Hobson defend this one all the way yes he will so he's got away with the slowdown and on the brakes he can just get it going but here's the up and under attempt coming from Rizzo. He's trying everything to get up into second. But at the moment, he may just have the best run yet. But it's heavily defended. Yeah, certainly is. I noticed uh, Hobson, I think he missed a gear just slightly coming out of the hairpin. That's what allows Rizzo to have this run. So now the side by side coming into the final chicane. Rizzo very wisely, I think, deciding to yield because, oh my goodness, Hobson, there we go. The World of Champions has claimed a victim, Sperry. Finally, after 24 laps, Brenton Hobson may be a future champion, but he is absolutely concrete bangside himself into that wall. And just like that, Hobson will be very, very fortunate in some respects um, on the way that he's hit that. But he hit that driver side, which is the most scariest point of all because you will see that he's hit that wall and he is lucky that the vehicle isn't too badly damaged on this one. It does promote Cholak up into third, but just for the moment at least, Ross Rizzo got his reward by just being the aggressor. Yeah, that's it. And I'll tell you what, um, this is a really good run from Ross Rizzo as we take a look at uh, the battle for the top 10. Riley Blythe and Benjamin Smith side by side and David Kinman once again in there with these guys. Oh my goodness, that's looking a bit awkward. They almost ran each other off the road there, did uh, <laughs> did Blythe and Smith. My goodness. So, coming into this chicane, look at the run that Blythe has through the mid corner. Smith just not able to hook up the exit, but Blythe has nowhere to go. He doesn't know. Of course, that corner always is about application, application, application. Heavy defense. Is there a door open for Riley? Oh, yes, there is. Sliding down the inside and almost no. leaving enough room. There's contact between no. them. One, two, and they hold it together somehow. And now let's know his arc too wide, too deep. They will go into Le Bangle, And now they're looking to try and see who's going to be the best on the brakes. Blythe still holding on to it. And he almost rally cross slides it through. Shoves him out to try with a bit of contact. Benjamin Smith is learning the hard way how to fight. And Kidman's going to no. try and they go around one two both going through and a big big hit to boot as well Kidman's going to try and get that one back going again in a very dangerous part of the circuit that may just throw the safety car out such was the damage 
we stay green for the moment, but my goodness, that had massive ramifications as Smith loses out now to Sanford. Oh, that is a real shame for those guys. We've got a replay here from Kinman's perspective. So Smith, um, oh, he just attempted to move over to the right, but Kinman was still there. Well, that's sometimes the place you've got to get. You get car right, car right. But ultimately, when two's there, you should still hear the still there. And that wasn't what was needed. The battle for second, though, hotting up. Look at Chiolak having this fantastic little push to try and get back into this. So here is Ross Rizzo. He's been very good on that defense, but now Cholak starts to think, okay, can I get aggressive? He's looking at that very tight line off the exit and very precise as well. There was Ross Rizzo doing well. So Bircher as well, even on this one for fifth place because Liam Wilde has been anything but today. And he's now thinking about, okay, opportunity knocking here. I could get myself fifth and maybe even fourth if Hobson's still struggling with that damage, which clearly he is. Yeah, that's exactly right. Wild, another one of those star drivers from today with uh, a very uh, sterling recovery effort. So there is your second to sixth battle right there in the frame. Tell you what, it is super close coming into the last couple of laps of this one. These guys have just started the penultimate lap of the race, and that is David Kinman stopped at, uh, I believe that's the exit of the chicane before the hairpin. Yeah, and well, he's got himself a clearance that he's needed to get going. No safety car gets thrown, so they thought he was okay, and out of the way is Luke Page. Uh, he's letting through for a slowdown penalty, and he will drop a number of positions at that point but Reese, my goodness look at Hobson's struggle now because he has been caught by Bircher yeah certainly has we'll briefly stay with this replay to see what happened to Luke Page but then immediately go to that uh, that fourth place battle so it just looks to me like they went side by side oh, coming into the chicane and I think Luke Page just took a little bit too much curb there my goodness, Cholak almost got a piece of Ross Rizzo through the second chicane. They hold it together. He tries the outside Ooh. line. It's not working, and they keep going a little bit further back. There's Luke Page trying to get... Oh, sorry, Liam Wilde, sorry, trying to get by Cody Bircher. He's not having any of it. The white flag will come out, though, for Ryan O'Sullivan, who has run with a brilliant point of driving and battling and making sure that he has just placed his car at the right place at the right time. Here Ooh. comes Bircher down the inside of Hobson, and Hobson gets the tap through worries, oh. and now he hits the magic sixth place, and he oh. goes all over the place and spins it around as well, showing absolute frustration at what's happened, and now it will take a very big turn to get around. He does, and he will continue to move forward. Battle for second, though. Still on at the moment here as Cholak has been struggling out of two, heading towards three and four, and for the moment, he's looking to try and open up an opportunity. Wild looking at fourth position as well. He's been so patient behind Cody Bircher, but surely he'll be looking for a mistake out of the 36 if he wants anything to happen. To Cholak, though, heading to six and seven. This is the Vettel corner that you've got to try and get by, and no, he's not going to find that, but we've seen through eight and nine, that's been the kryptonite of Ross Rizzo. Cholak has been so much better through that section. Ryan O'Sullivan though, still leading this one. Five seconds the advantage under no pressure whatsoever to get himself over into the big dance. But final few chicanes coming and Rizzo still looks okay. This is the big dive point. Can Cholak get the run through here to open up the corner into that final chicane? For the moment, it looks like he's setting up and diving Banzai late, trying to get it through. Rizzo gives him the room, but can Rizzo pick up the exit? He can. So much better, in fact, he is. And that may just save him all the way to the end, but Cholak will pick up the draft and try and go for it one more time. For Ryan O'Sullivan, though, he will take the final two corners, barring the wall of champions as Hobson has found. Ryan O'Sullivan is going to come across the line and take a big victory. Cholak goes Banzai, though. He slows it up. Rizzo can't get the power application down. And Cholak will hold on for second position as they charge themselves to the line. A great scrap. Bircher will get third. But Liam Wilde has run himself into issues. He is out of fuel coming to the line. He left the KRF car a little slow. But he will hold off the likes of Brad Ratu 
just behind. Brenton Hobson is a long way away now in seventh position for this, or even further behind as he struggles. But my goodness, what a uh, what a dramatic three-part race, effectively, we had in that one race. Yeah, absolutely. There were some great performances in that one and some real surprises as well. And I'll tell you one thing, I'm super impressed with uh, the way Sealak and Rizzo conducted themselves on that last lap. It was a very crazy battle. I almost thought Sealak wasn't going to make the chicane, but he managed to do it. Ryan O'Sullivan, though, your winner on screen at the moment. My goodness, an absolute cracker of a performance from him from seventh up to first brilliant he's done fantastically let's get classified results then up on your screen it's ryan o'sullivan who picks up the win then in a time of 47 minutes and 39 seconds he holds off mitchell cholak by 5.2 who does banzai away past ross rizzo on the final corner who got ceremoniously dumped by lee ellis just on the pit stop window cody bircher solid drive into fourth with liam wilde running out of fuel in fifth brad ratu gets sixth position with carl james and dylan shepherd seventh and eighth brenton hobson unfortunately coming home in ninth real shame for him riley blythe though making up a lot of positions from 20th to round out the top 10. brenton o'brien finishes 11th luke page in 12th scott larnack one of the hardest charges out there started 32nd now in 13th he, he is followed by david sanford tom freer and an unfortunate benjamin smith Bruce Kiley, a very quiet day from him up to 17th. Damon Mulqueen gets 18th. There's Jacob Knight, who's had issues to 19th. And Guy Leach rounds out the top 20. It's, it's uh, Scott O'Keefe and Damian Johnstone who round out those on the leading lap. Dion Peters and Andrew Fraser fall a lap down. Yep, and we're getting into the heavily damaged and the retirees now. David Kinman and Mark Newton there with Gary Cooper also coming a cropper. Greg Sharp. Uh, massively unfortunate turned by Scott Larnack Lance Perkins and Christopher Kessie also falling into troubles Lee Ellis one of the biggest surprises of the race running straight into the back of Ross Rizzo as uh, he went to take the pit entry and Jamie McKnight classified 32nd and some more retirements include Todd Parks, Andy Sim, uh, Stephen Varga, Kane Hewson and Thomas Hins did not make the start of this event but we're going to step aside very briefly here when it comes to the iRacing Esports Network because post-race coverage of Super Split 2 moving on towards that top split is going to be absolutely fantastic to see. Sis to the front bumper and he hits him again now. Ray Alfala into the outside wall. He's going to pass nearly three cars down that front straightaway. And he's gonna get him all done with. What a amazing lead to the inside goes low in clap and is gonna touch in. Hit press. He saved it. What a save! Looks to the outside and Kronke goes off. De Jong into second place. I'm going for the switch back. Oh, pinpoint driving. It's howling oh. down to the inside. I tried this contact though. Slide left to the racetrack. Chris Renner drives it back down underneath and he takes that second spot right back.
Growing up as a kid in Oklahoma, where I'm from, the Chili Bowl is the biggest race that we have. The Chili Bowl has kind of been my favorite race of the year. Growing up a dirt racer in Oklahoma, that's kind of the holy grail. Fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got tracks and he's got everything else. Oh, oh, he's taking Anderson. Anderson's up to him. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, the field's going to get rolled. This is very close. These guys are one I want to make their way through the field very quickly. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's massive. This is it. This is over. I can't believe this. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What? This is the original eSport racing game. This is iRacing. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Virtual Racing School V8 Supercars Online Premier Series, the number one Australasian series in the world at the moment, as well as the number one V8 Supercar League out there racing today. A fantastic Super Split 2 race, which had pretty much everything here. But joining us in the commentary booth right now is Ross Rizzo. Ross, pole position seemed fantastic. You got yourself a great run, held a very good start. The one thing you didn't account for was a torpedo known as Lee Ellis. <laughs> yeah, um, well, literally the, the, the whole plan was going extremely well. I was hoping I'd be able to gap Lee, but that wasn't uh, the case. But I was still, you know, just hitting, hitting my marks, not getting slowdowns. That was priority number one. And it was all going so, so well. Um, and then, yeah, hard, hard to say, hard to say anything positive about the incident Lee did apologize so I, I, I very much respect respect that but um yeah pretty devastated but at the same time I'm on the I'm usually the beneficiary of um some luck like that so it's probably about time it turned on its head but um it really it really made a great race towards the end as well I really enjoyed the last seven or eight laps of that and I thought it was an absolutely cracking race and thoroughly enjoyed it and um big congratulations to Ryan O'Sullivan and well, of course, you had that battle on the final lap with uh, Mitchell Stiolak. And well, uh, for you, really, a, a battle where you had to play that defensive card. He was really trying to harass in a few corners here and there. But let's just talk through that final corner as well, because it seemed that he came from nowhere or from, uh, you know, Hubble telescope levels back to try and make that move. Well, I thought he was about to do what um, 
poor Hobbo did and make the fence, but um, yeah, I don't know how he managed to, to keep it off there, but um, you know, uh, basically at the point that I hit the brakes, I'm like, look, if you want to go, if you're going to make it, you deserve second place. So um, <laughs> there you go. So um, he did, a, I don't know how he managed to pull it up, but that was a fantastic battle. Um, I do think I was down on straight line, so I just had to try and make the best of um, best of what I could, but I was still getting really good drive out of the um, the areas that mattered, but eventually <laughs> a massive send, uh, I, a massive send was um, the kryptonite in the end, so congrats to, to Mitchell on being able to pull that off. Well, very surprisingly, and I think for the first time in about a year, your night ends early here at this stage, so what happens next for you is looking over towards Interlagos. Just how important at the moment has pre-qualifying become, seeing as you haven't managed to make it over towards this second split, or to the top split for the first time in about a year? Well, it's absolutely the talking point um, of this season so far. I mean, so many stories came out of just pre-qualifying alone to have the strength of field that we had tonight for split two just goes to show how much the, the field has stepped up with a lot of the new talent, the young talent um, and stuff that we're about to see. It's going to be really, really exciting. So pre-qualifying is more important than ever. And it's just about being the right side of a 10th when you're on the cusp like myself and Brenton and, and Ryan were, you know, um, so you, you, can, you have to, yeah, yeah it's, it's, um, it's going to be a big grind and big struggle uh, when you're on the wrong side of the 10th to be able to make top split. Yep, that certainly does seem to be the case. But before we let you go, Ross, any shout outs or uh, sponsors? Uh, first of all, huge thank you to um, Virtual Racing School, uh, series sponsor, um, and the Oceanic Sim Racing for putting together this magnificent series. And it's going to be a fantastic year, if that race was anything to go by. Uh, big congratulations to Ryan O'Sullivan and Evolution Racing Team on that magnificent win. Um, and to Trick Sim Sports, the boys at Trick, Forzan, um, Anthony, Marty, Scott, uh, Michael, um, and our sponsors, Trick Custom Fabrications and Knight Rider Designs. No worries at all. Ross Rizzo there joining us. He gets a podium finish. We are getting word, though, here, ladies and gentlemen. It will be a delayed start to top split action. I repeat, a delayed start. This is due to issues with server commands that have gone in. We've got a few things that haven't been corrected, but will be. So we will have a delayed start to the event of super or of split one action that we have proceeding. Reese, we're going to now get another driver in for interview. He had a very quiet race, but a strong one. And that is Bradley Ratu. Yes, indeed. Bradley Ratu joining us in the commentary box here. Brad, welcome. It was uh, it was an interesting one for you. Certainly uh, going through all of that mayhem. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I had a pretty good race uh, for most of it. Um, I was lucky to stay out of all that uh, mayhem in the first lap. I was just uh, just in front of it. It happened right behind me. I saw it all happen in my mirror, actually. Yeah, certainly. It really, really took some nous to uh, to avoid all of that. But uh, you ended up making some good ground. Uh, I did. Uh, I had really good pace, actually, uh, throughout the race. Um, I'm sure you may have seen my stuff up uh, into the pit entry, which did not help. But uh, mm. I was definitely on the charge towards the front. Uh, I was going to try my best to get there. And, uh, yeah, I stuffed up. What happened there in the pits, Brad? Um, well, <laughs> I was pushing quite hard. Um, it was just a mistake on my behalf. Uh, I got on the brakes. Um, I went back a little bit further uh, on the brake bias uh, than I was in practice. And I didn't anticipate that going into the pit, uh, the pit lane. And I hit the brakes and it just locked up. And it was all my fault, so... Well, nonetheless, um, the, the, the pace and uh, the potential result that you showed uh, definitely shows that things may be brighter for you in the future. Definitely. Uh, I did have a spot of that race, and thank you to Dominic for that. Uh, he was saying that um, I may have been quickest on track, so there's also that. <laughs> Yeah, also, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we do have confirmation from our director, Jay Kennedy, that for a point there, you were the fastest car on track. So that really bodes well for future rounds of the series. Oh, that's awesome. I just got to improve my qualifying. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely seems that way. Well, anyway, Brad, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Who would you like to give a shout out to? 
I'd like to thank the, all of my team. A lot of my team helped me throughout uh, the setting up and the preparation for this scops. And also Brett Cananzi, he helped me out a bit as well, um, getting the setups ready and we helped each other out a lot. And thank you to Gamers Apparel for uh, providing us with jerseys to wear um, to our events and even racing like and And also a uh, big, big thank you to you guys for hosting this league as well. Fantastic stuff. Thank you very much, Brad. We will catch you hopefully at some point later on in the season. But Sperry, uh, as we are going through this intermission period in this event, I think this might be an opportune time to have a chat about the huge amount of team changes we've had in this community. And well, no better person to talk about that than team boss of Evolution Racing Team, Brenton O'Brien. Brenton, uh, a good race for you first and foremost, but more importantly, you've got your man Rhino Sullivan, another member you can add to the roster uh, for Split 1 proceedings, but some really fantastic signings that have come in from you, no less than the reigning champion. After um, Sully's five laps of practice he did this afternoon, I actually said to the boys, yeah, I knew he was qualifying about eighth or ninth, and I said, if he does a clean race, he'll win it, because he just... He gets better as the race goes on. So, yeah, it's a bonus to get him in the top split now because he, he will have some genuine pace to uh, to get amongst it. So, yeah, um, yeah, stoked for my result as well. But, yeah, obviously had a couple of signings with Jordan Ross and Jared. I can't, the last name keeps escaping me. But, yeah, he goes all right as well. Yeah, he certainly does go all right. And he proves that he's got uh, a lot of pace. But in terms of uh, sort of the uh, foundations that you've built now over the course of... Um, the winter period moving into this one. You've got yourself Phil Cell, Ethan Grigg Galt still there. You've got the likes of, say, Riley Blythe, who's been doing well. Got Jordan Ross, who's on suspension at the moment, but should be back for the second round of the championship. Let's not forget Cooper Webster's seemingly in a fantastic position. Do you feel like Evolution Racing Team now are really gunning for that number one spot in Australia, especially with the collapse of ASM and the exodus of TT, uh, TTR? Look, it's we, we don't want to jump ahead of the queue and say that we're going to be number one, but let's face it, we've got some pretty good drivers on board that puts us in a position to hopefully end up in a good spot at the end of the season. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Like Jared's main focus this year, and we're not pretending anything else, is the Porsches. He um, did sensationally well last night in the second last round of the qualifying series. He's got himself a black stripe, so congratulations to him. So that's going to be his main focus. Ethan, with the ADS win, is going to be concentrating a lot on that as well. Whether he misses a round or two, I don't know. But, you know, Cooper's going to be there thereabouts all season. And so is Jordan. There's another guy, Ian Ford, as well, which we always seem to forget about. But he's just got himself a whole heap of new gear. He's going to get himself a chance to do a heap, whole heap of new you know, laps as well in practice. And let's see how he goes. So, yeah, looking forward to what should be a strong season. And looking forward to this big race moving forward. Um, you, of course, you're going to have your eye on your team and everyone that's going to be working on. But surely this is the one season where everyone seemingly elevated their game. And surely there are maybe 10, even 15 candidates out there for a race victory this season. How good is it? Like, seriously, when these guys grid up in however long, half an hour, 40 minutes, the grid is going to look completely different. It's going to be absolutely stunning. And there's going to be so many different drivers, as you said, 10 to 15 drivers with a genuine chance of not just taking the series, or sorry, taking a race win, but taking the series. So it's going to be, it's gone from strength to strength, 160 cars pre qualified I was lucky enough to make second split, um, even luckier to get through to 11th. So I'm personally really stoked for that. But yeah, look at the guys who were in the front row in the second split. And then look at the guys who weren't able to race through suspension or with Jordan, I think he's actually over in Hawaii at the moment. Um, so there's so many more guys who are still going to be able to race in the weeks coming up. So, uh, it, man, it's going to be a hard gig to get in the second split even. But yeah, the racing is going to be awesome all year. Well, it certainly will be. And there is team boss of Evolution Racing Team, Brenton O'Brien, joining us in for conversation. And Reese. That's not even the long and short of it. Let's just get a graphic up on screen on the sort of driver changes that happened comparatively from the top 20 in the championship last year to this year. And it's absolutely astronomical. I think almost half of the drivers are in a new team. Yeah, exactly. Jared Philsell, of course, one of the biggest stories there. Leaving Trans-Tasman Racing and going to Evolution Racing Team, joining his 
former championship rival Ethan Grig Galt from last year. That's a huge story. Jake Burton also uh, parting ways with TTR and going to positive sim racing. Luke Harvey as well to privateer. And speaking of TTR, Sam Blacklock from last year. He, along with uh, Dane and Ethan Warren, formerly of All Star Motorsports, they've gone to Altus Esports. They are serious about their campaign this year. They certainly are, and after what was considered a disastrous campaign by the Warren Standard, uh, you have to say that this is a new leaf, it's a fresh turn of coat, and now they are going to be looking to try and push on for this 2019 season. And what better time to start pushing for it at a track which actually for Evolution Racing Team looked fantastic for them last year. A mistake cost them that victory overall, but this is where you start looking at this new season. You start thinking about, okay, well, who's the big challengers? And right now you look at that Trans-Tasman team and you think, well, Madison Downs got this a lot tougher than he's had in previous years because he's got to hold out all on his own. Yeah, they've got a nice fresh livery have uh, Trans-Tasman Racing with the, with the departure of quite a few of their drivers. But uh, yeah, you can definitely tell it's a bit of a disappointing position for Trans-Tasman to be in. They do still have some capable drivers at their stable, the likes of Kurt Stenberg and Emily Jones definitely showing potential. But it is going to be a lot more difficult for the likes of Madison Down than it was previously. And it's not just the fact that we've uh, had a lot of teams in. Let's not forget that TTL still have their core of drivers, Richard Hampstead and Jake Maloney are looking to spearhead another season. After suspension, Brady Myers uh, will get there maybe if he has about 15 engines that he's got at his disposal. But at the moment, you've even got the likes of Jackson Suzlan Harlow, who yeah. could come out and really become that next star over the next few rounds after his suspension serve. There are so many drivers out there, especially in TTL as well. I think they've gone very quietly under the radar this season, and they could turn up and really shock the and rock the apple cart. Yeah, I think there's definitely potential for TTL to do that. I've been quite impressed with Harlow's form in uh, in recent times. You know, his first scop start was at the Imola 500 last year for Middle Finger Racing, and from then on, he has just gone in leaps and bounds. He's a young Carter, is uh, Jackson and he has really made good on that. Awesome results in other series that we at SimSpeed TV broadcast, like uh, Sprint Series Australasia, but uh, V8 Supercars, certainly a place where he has got pace as well. And TTL, they do have history. They are one of the oldest teams in sim racing full stop. They've been around since the Grand Prix Legends days in the late 1990s. So there's uh, a lot of cool heads at that team that can definitely bring Harlow up to the, the standard that we know he can be and of course you have to look at one performance racing as well because they've got wayne burke who is arguably going to be their spearhead taken away from synergy but let's not forget thomas mcmillan either and if mcmillan's practicing and if mcmillan's got his game face on then my goodness he's a top 10 driver every day of the week yeah absolutely mcmillan is a driver that you know, we, we've all ribbed on at some point. He's a bit rough around the edges in his driving, but you still see the potential there. You still see the pace. And I really hope that uh, McMillan, once, uh, once he comes back, uh, will be able to show that potential, possibly get into some top tens. We know he's capable of it. And let's not forget that this is an international series as well, not just Australian sim races, because the Brits are coming. One Englishman and one Scotsman have made their way into top split. Nicole Foggy, the Scotsman, has been uh, someone who has been a sight for eyes over on Apex Racing TV, our good friends here at the SimSpeed Esports Network. But on top of that, there is the very, very underrated and incredibly lightning fast Johnny Brandon. And he will be looking to look like Johnny Bravo in the way that he will muscle his way up through the field. Yeah, absolutely. Johnny Brandon and Nicole Foggy getting into this series. Really good uh, call from them to have a go at this one. It's really awesome. You know, V8 Scops has from the start been an Australia and New Zealand league 
we're in that part of the world. These are our cars. This is what we have raced for so long. Uh, but uh, the Brits and the Euros having a go at this car is certainly a welcome sight to see, especially in the Euro V8 Supercar Championships. The likes of Johnny Brandon and Nicole Foggy successful in that section of the Sim Sphere. It'll be interesting to see how they go. It will be, and it's the sort of thing where I'd like to see more international drivers come in. I know there's a massive Spanish community of V8 supercar drivers, the likes of Adria, Perez and co. Uh, may want to try and find themselves in, and I guess this would be the testing point. Well, how good could those guys do if they decided they wanted to make that push? But practice is going to be completed. It's 20 minutes of open qualification that comes next and now this is where the pressure is going to tell this is central and we hit split one qualifying here with the iRacing esports network and simspeed tv first on track then let's see who's going to get the advantage and it's nick cummings who will be the first to hit followed swiftly by richard hampstead and look at that cummings decides no hampstead you're quicker i'm going to let you through there's another drive we haven't talked about today here Reece. nick cummings is mm. looking better and better than ever yeah absolutely nick cummings uh we've seen him race more and more in the last few months since the the new year came in and uh, i'm certainly looking forward to seeing how he does he uh, he was um uh, pretty competitive in practice running one minute 35 times so we'll see how he goes in this session drop the fuel get out there and race although i have seen some drivers say that uh, that driving on race fuel is actually a little quicker because the fuel tank is in the rear of these cars and anything you can do to settle the rear end results in pace so some drivers might be running increased fuel loads well there is that they have to worry about as well as the iRacing dynamic track that comes into play of course for 2019 this track will heat up and cool down the clouds will move over the circuit and this is going to be a really tough challenge for these drivers because in 20 minutes of open qualifying yes the track will get a little bit hotter with the amount of rubber that gets put down as we will go on board with Richard Hamstead in the 28 to see one flying lap around circuit Gilles Villeneuve but more importantly than that, it's the case of where and when are you on circuit when the track has got full sunshine or when that track is cooled down. It's about when you get on track and when it favours you to get that pace. Into one and two then, this fantastic chicane. On the brakes, nice and tight, massive lockup though, with a bit of trail brake coming from Hampstead, trying to get on the power as quick as possible to rotate that rear end, and he does so without too many worries. Three and four then comes along next, this down the hill chicane so easy to run into the wall i think he may have just got a tap there on that lap a few sparks coming off and i think that may be lap abandoned maybe but we'll see he's uh, still going hell for leather in this section of the circuit get nice and early on the throttle in third gear good exit down this back stretch here at montreal and then you come up to the uh, chicane that has taken many a race from many people. All over the curbs is Richard Hamstead, two wheeling it out onto the exit. And then you come down to Le Pangler, the hairpin. This is one of the prime overtaking spots on the circuit. Swing out wide, bring it over to the left, hard on the brakes, down into first gear in these V8 supercars, and then get the car straightened as quick as you can and get on the throttle as quick as you can because you've got a big straight coming. Used to be that this was uh, the location of a few sweepers before the track was modified after the mid-1990s, but now it's a straight blast to this tight final chicane with really big curbs and the wall of champions waiting for you. Richard Hampstead is going. He's going to finish at the lap here all over those white anti-cut curbs and very good exit. Let's see what the time is from the TTL Esports driver, the first V8 Scots champion. It's a 1 minute 34 598. Awesome time from him. That is provisional pole for now. It is the 134.4 for Cooper Webster, though. Ooh, Sets yeah. the precedence then with a good time. Ethan Warren does well. Madison down, though. 34.3 decides that he sets the early pace. Ethan Grigg Galt, 34.6. Not good enough. Fourth position at the moment. Here comes Jared Philsell, two-time reigning champ. 
and he does himself 34-2 to put himself right in fairy tale land. That's fantastic work from the number one, and there is one for a reason on his machine. Likes of Emily Jones now, she will make her way to the line, as she's the only female driver in this field, at least for this event. 35-4 from her, that will drop her 23rd position, but it is a Phil Cell down Loxton, your top three. Yes, indeed. We're taking a look at Wayne Burke as he goes across the start finish line. Another 34 for him. Puts him up into the top 10. Excellent job from the new One Performance Racing signing uh, Dane Warren into the pits. It's very interesting not only seeing him in a Ford, but also in an Altus livery. Yes, and this Altus livery looks absolutely sensational. And they will be pushing to the very, very limits to see how they can get themselves as far forward as possible. This is about times. And often we saw last year, the person who could get the timing early would not be caught. This year, I think we're going to see a, this a little bit differently. I think we're going to see this track evolve and really be one where you have to attack. Maybe you can do two laps on a stint. But drivers now know they've got to get times in very, very nicely. Jake Burton, for example, dives down onto pit road. He's currently in eighth position in the Aussie driver search car. And now he's trying to look to go through with positive sim racing. And of course, that university, Isabel the first on that side, probably one of the top esports teams uh, that are going around in terms of university bound. And of course, the work that Javier Alvarez has done for them has been nothing short of sensational. Yeah, absolutely has. Positive Sim Racing, one of those really big international teams. As we briefly focused on Burton there, we have been focusing for the most part the last couple of minutes on this guy, though, Michael Healy. He has recently made the move to Trick Sim Sports. He is another driver that has bolstered Trick Sim Sports lineup in the previous few weeks, along with Scott Sidlowski, uh, Trent Thomas, and Alexander Bird. Uh, Healy running incredibly well uh, in the series that he runs in, particularly in Porsches. Haven't seen him out and about in the V8 uh, for a short amount of time. Just coming through the chicane now. He's the only driver on a hot lap at the moment as the session's coming up to its halfway point. Let's see what kind of time Mr. Healy can set here. It's going to be in the 35, it's a mid 35. So uh, that is not going to put him up particularly high. Dane and Ethan Warren here coming across the line. And this is going to be the start of oh. a run for these two. I had a look at it and I thought it was good, but then I realized, oh, it's a 43 instead of a, a 33. So that is my bad. <laughs> but for the moment, he's got Sam Blacklock. He's towing along as well. He hasn't set a lap time either in this event. So Blacklock now has to make sure he gets that time in. Someone who arguably has to be up there and trying to push that really top level and trying to get those results he got himself a podium last year at most sport but the change of team is looking for better fortunes and dane warren who had an abysmal year by his standards he's now got to look and try and challenge for pole position anything short of that i think isn't what he'd be looking for here top five bare minimum yeah, I would say so. That's pretty fair from Dane Warren's perspective. Unfortunately, it looks like he's uh, cut that corner a fair bit. He hasn't lifted off, though, so I don't think he's gotten the slowdown penalty. He's going to see this one through and provide a draft for his teammate just behind him. And there is a bit of pressure on uh, on these guys to perform. It was big news noting that Altus Esport had picked these guys up and they are really looking to stamp their authority on V8 Scops here. Really good to see some new contenders out there in terms of teams. We run on board with Blacklock here coming through the final chicane. That's Warren just up ahead of him there. Looks like a really good exit from both of them. And the times will be coming in fairly shortly. For Warren, it is going to be a 34-5. For Blacklock, it is going to be a 34-5 as well. That's a 34-6 for Sam Blacklock. He will go ninth. Dane Warren, though, will go into sixth place and split Ford and Hampstead up together. So, Phil Cell down. Loxton, Webster, Hampstead, your top five. From there, Dane Warren, Ian Ford, Ethan Grigg, Gold, Sam Blacklock, and Jake Burton round out the top ten. On board with the 77 of Madison Dan Hall. That would have been a bit scary, having a yeah. spinner in front. And that was the CMR car of Marlon McMullen 
who goes around and in front of Madison down would have been a little bit scary. I think Madison needs Steady's help here. Kurt Stenberg just managed to qualify himself in in pre-qualification. He's got himself a 100% record in split two, but at the moment he finds himself 20. Oh, good as Madison has a Ouch. big moment. Bang into the wall of champions. He's got to get around the lap. Yeah, of course, a big, big uh, opportunity here to remind people as we see Brett Loxton pulling over to let some people by. Reminder that we have a no escape rule in the V8 Supercar Online Premier Series. You are not allowed to stop on track and just press escape to go back to your garage. You need to complete an in-lap and go into the pit lane yourself. So if you're, if you're new to this series, that's the way it's done around here. That's from 10, 11th to 15th it's Jake Maloney Ethan Warren Nick Cummings Wayne Burke and Joshua Anderson Anderson driving for Vendaval Sim Racing they put their names in the hat for this one they said yes we do want to run a few laps and do some good jobs and it's nice to see them going just behind though there's Jake Burton in the positive Sim Racing car and he's got Luke Harvey there in tow Harvey running privateer he's got that nice little tennis livery that he had a couple of seasons ago one season at uh, uh, Trans Tasman Racing said nope not for me and he had some very good runs. But now here's the question for Luke Harvey. Can he find that same sort of speed he had at Trans-Tasman all on his own? Well, Harvey, you got to remember, is ex-Evolution Racing Team as well. So um, those guys certainly imparting some knowledge to him as well. I think Luke Harvey can... Uh, and get some good results here he's not doing too badly he's currently sitting in 16th place so i can definitely see that he will be good in the midfield will he be able to challenge for top tens maybe if he can stay out of trouble but um i, I think he'd be satisfied with where he is at the moment I think someone who should be very satisfied is Brett Loxton because that KRF car has absolutely done wonders so far in the early stages. Gets a clip of wall though, and that won't be helping him in terms of this lap. So he'll have to come in, get a new car, and get back out again. But my goodness, this top five, well, apart from Evolution Racing Team, who have managed to snipe up in three. Look at Wayne Burke. He's now got himself up into seventh position now. Ian Ford now up into fourth. So it's all change at the moment here. And they are finding time in the middle of this race. And let's not forget here, Corey Preston's just moved himself up into 14th position. So he's just himself sim racing, but he's having a great run here at the start of the new season. Yeah, certainly is. Impressive run from Preston. Not back down to 15th briefly, but uh, it's um, it's looking pretty good for him at the moment. Phil Cell just coming across the line there um, in the hopes of increasing his position uh, or his, uh, his gap up at the front, but not able to. Impressive uh, performance from Corey Preston so far, though, Sperry. I would have to agree with you there. We do have Blacklock and Warren, though, out on track in those Altus cars, trying to get another run at improving their position in the top ten as Jake Burton looks to prep himself for it as well. Yes, he's looking for his lap, and he's going to go through the final corner and then push forward. Zizlowski behind, though, does run a little bit wide, and that wasn't ideal. He lets Cracknell go through and... He will try and make his runs through. But we've got eight minutes to go on the clock. Eight minutes to find some magic. And at the moment, the top 14 are split by four tenths of a second. If that's not qualifying gold, I don't know what is. As I just spy Sean Kelly getting a huge sideways moment. And he's down in 38th position. So even 38 pushing with everything that's available. Yeah, certainly, as Jake Burton crosses the line and remains 11th with a 34.480. Incredibly close times here at the moment as Cooper Webster tries his hand at getting a better time here as well. 34.683. That's uh, not quicker than his current best, but he remains in the top five. And I'll tell you what, I absolutely love in terms of the driver changes this season, like the likes of uh, Brett Loxton. He's now full-time at Zuva Racing, and he has said that he is targeting success this season. After his performance at the Montreal 600 last season, I definitely think he could do it. How about that, Sperry? Brett Loxton, Australian online supercar champion, and uh, really looking good at Montreal. If any time's the time, now it is because that track 
just cooled slightly with the cloud cover, especially on the back half of the circuit right now. Someone like Forzan El Nabi will need to use that winner of the Bathurst 1000 with, of course, Ross Rizzo, who we saw in split two. So now we're starting to see drivers get desperate here. Someone like Cooper Webster here could massively benefit. He's currently in fifth position, two tenths of a second. Can he be found with colder conditions if the track goes over? Ethan Warren and Kurt Stenberg alike. But right now, Cooper is probably the darling right now and touted as the biggest future champion in this series. He's just 15 years of age and he finds himself right at the pointy end. Yes, indeed. We go to Cooper Webster now just to uh, have a look at how this lap ends up for him. He's on his the third lap of this run, and he's going straight for the pits there. So let's go back to Madison Brown briefly. He is on a flyer, currently sitting in second. Will he be able to get that one-tenth of a second that he needs in order to beat Jared Philsell to pole in the final five minutes of this session? Let's have a look. A couple of cars just coasting to a stop here. Oh, no. Madison had to have a couple of goes at the brake there. I don't think he was sure that that car was moving over for him. I don't think he was either, but Forza El Nabi has moved his way up into 11th. Josh Muggleton will push his way to the line. Let's see what he's got under his lead. Nothing at the moment looks to set up his flying lap. Nicole Foggy goes over the line and does a 35 lap, but slightly slower, unable to find a little bit more time. Dane Warren, though, for example, is just setting up his lap along with Sam Blacklock, and Chris Coxhead decides he wants to go down the inside, and he is on a flying lap where Blacklock instantly has to back out of it. Yeah, exactly. Chris Coxhead now assuming the 15th place position here, and he is looking rather pacey. His fastest lap of 35.021 so far. So, oh no, sorry, uh, 34.692 is his qualifying time. I was looking at his practice times. My apologies. But uh, Chris, man, that's a bit too much curb there. I don't know if that's going to sit lightly. Richard Hampstead moves up to third with a oh. great 34.387. He's a thousandth quicker than Brett Loxton. Hampstead is here to show everybody how it's done. And he's made a magical lap time out of that as the five minute warning now soon will turn to a four minute warning right now as the sun begins to shine back out once again so now the advantage turns the other direction griffin gardner's not had the best of qualifying so far and he will now look to try and set a lap time so right now you have to say there are drivers who have not performed here today griffin gardner emily jones i think hasn't really done good enough same for marlon mcmullen yes there is a race there are drivers up there near the top who have done wonders so far in qualifying and the biggest one of the lot has to be Brett Loxton. Yeah, certainly. Loxton has been one of the stars of the show here tonight. Really looking forward to seeing what he can do come the race. But uh, Jared Philsell currently on another hot lap. He has been one of the stars of V8 Scops at large over the last few seasons. Run, won the championship two times on the trot now and uh, we'll see how he goes on this one that could be a 34 oh. no, oh, wow that's crazy so he has just extended his lead Madison Downs going to have a little bit more work to do if he wants to change that let's have a look at Loxton as he goes across the line this is going to be a good one from him wow a 34 285 that is infringing on Phil Sell's territory he goes to second Front row, Brett Loxton. Jad Philsell may be the poster boy, but look at the people trying to chase that down. Top five within two tenths of a second right now as Ian Ford as well tries to get in on it. You've got to get out there though and get across the line before zero because when you, when you finish your lap, you have until the end of your lap to get this one sorted. And all of a sudden, qualifying like this has never been so good. And let's talk about surprises. Ethan Grigolt, through all of this, is only in position number nine at the moment and starting a flying lap. Yeah, so the pressure here is on Ethan Grigolt, currently on a 34-6. As um, we look at Cooper Webster going through the twisty section of the track, currently in sixth position, he is. So... Pressure's on for him as well, but how about Greg Galt? He's trailing him slightly. And uh, looking very smooth and controlled as per usual with, uh, with Greg Galt's driving. It's something that we've come oh. to expect from him. 
Sam Blacklock finds himself a hundredth off of what he needed in 10th position. I thought he maybe found a bit more time. As there's a spinner on the front stretch, that's Brett Cananzi. Minute and a half left on the clock as through will go Joshua Anderson to look to set a time. And Phil Sell, I believe, is day and done. He will not be able to go out and get another lap time in. So now it's a case of catch me if you can from everyone else in this field. And this suddenly could be the great shakeup as a minute will soon come on the clock. Yes, indeed. Cooper Webster making his way through the last chicane there. Let's see how he can improve, possibly. The Evolution Racing Team number 37 crossing the line here. And it's going to be a mid-34 for him once again. He's down in six, still not able to match his current best. Let's see how Greg Galt does. Through the chicane, he goes. He's currently sitting in ninth on the 34-6-1. Let's see what he can do here. That's going to be much worse there. 35049. Unfortunately, not good enough for Grig Galt to make any headway. Let's see how the Aldous boys go, Sperry. Madison Down cannot do any better. He has pulled the vehicle off. Altus maybe have the best chance. Who's going to be last over the line and get that big advantage? Chris Coxhead will have one more lap to go after this. He's currently in 15th position. He does not go quicker on that one. Michael Healy gets himself over the line, as will Muggleton. And still, that clock goes in. All of Altus say they can't go quicker. Cracknell can't go quicker. Preston can't go quicker. What about Marlon McMullen? He decides game over. I can't do any more. Josh Anderson. Oh, big wiggle coming through the chicane. And has he gone too much? Time expires. That's his final lap. He's got he's 20th at the moment and a top 15 would be great for anderson's perspectives back in lap time doesn't count he will not go any quicker everybody else decides to dive in except james scott who had a very good pre-qualification he's 36th at the moment though 35-3 struggling at the moment when it comes to getting that lap time in and he will find a 35-9 which is certainly not what he wants the Maloney. track really hots up maloney though finds himself ninth. trying to go through ninth position for him on a 134.578 he'll be happy with that one more try to cross the line simon feigl team boss of altus esports looks to find something 35-2 to beat 35 flat he does he goes up to 27th position Cross the line comes Hampstead as well. That one will not count. But this is how everything is going to grid up here at this Montreal Circuit Gilles Villeneuve track because this has got everything written all over it. Got the last few drivers, though, trying to make that push. Likes of Muggleton, likes of Healy, likes of Coxhead. Coxhead can't do it. Healy can't do it. Muggleton is going to try here on his lap. He's 18th at the moment. Wall of Champions says no. And, well, that's going to be that. Spin for Stenberger as well. There's Phil Ooh. Sells going to get himself up and over towards the line two. And he will do himself no lap time. Two minutes overall. This is how the grid will stack. Jared Philsell then starts off the new year with a pole position. He's got Brett Loxton, though, alongside a Canada specialist. Madison Down starts third with Richard Hampstead fourth. Ian Ford will start with row three with Cooper Webster and all ERT row. It's, even, it's Wayne Burke who finds himself seventh for one performance with Dane Warren, the first Altus car in eighth. Jake Maloney starts ninth with Ethan Greg Galt in tenth. In 11th place, we've got Altus' Sam Blacklock. El Nabi lining up alongside him. Jake Burton and Ethan Warren on the next row, along with Chris, Ho Chris Coxhead and Scott Soslowski. Corey Preston maintains a top 20. Good to see. Josh Muggleton in 18th. Nick Cummings 19th. And Vendervals, Joshua Anderson, having to settle for 20th. Technical issues at the moment for Luke Harvey. I'm not sure he's going to make the start. He did qualify, though, 21st. Ryan O'Sullivan gets Doble Ducks with Michael Cracknell and Johnny Brandon on row 12. Emily Jones, Jamie McKee, Simon Feigl, and Nicole Foggy make up 28. It's Jack G. Boyd in 29th, and Marlon Mullen makes 30. In 31st, we have got Michael Healy and Sean Kelly alongside him kurt stenberg lines up alongside blake purdy carl stokes and james scott in 35th and 36th griffin gardner and brett cananzi starting to get towards the rear of the field and along with them we have dean o'brien john emerson and michael taliancic and that is how the field will look for them so for jared Philsell. It's a case of two minutes to grid up. It's a case of now defending that championship in the way that he knows how. He had a fantastic 2018 where he got victory upon victory upon victory. 
The way that he managed to set that season up from the beginning, though, was getting victories early. But look at everyone who will be trying to take that away from him. I'd say probably the top 15 all have a legitimate shot here of victory today. That sounds very, very silly to say, but they definitely have that opportunity to go and make that happen. Richard Hamstead, for example, he's an experienced head on experienced shoulders. He knows exactly how to race these sorts of races. Ian Ford especially, the fuel save dynamo that he manages to find himself to be. Wayne Burke is a maverick. He finds himself good. Cooper Webster may be untested at this high level. Does he have the ability to really kick it in when it matters the most? Well, he showed at Sebring he has those signs that he could be a champion. But of course, the 209, focus on Brett Loxton. He could be the man who now really rocks the apple cart. He's the unknown factor in the entirety of this field, and he is really in a position where the big boys now have to work out, do we play nice with him or do we play nasty in the early stages? Lights will soon come on on top of the iRacing gantry to get racing action underway at Circuit Shield Villeneuve. It's 58 laps worth of action that we're going to get. Engine notes now will start to rise. And let's get ourselves underway. And Phil Cell gets a pretty okay start. Will immediately look to cover Loxton as they make their way to one and two. They do so fine. And they're around the outside. Hampstead tries to push it to get to third position. Can he get the inside? Well, he's stuck narrow, but he's got a good run. And does he force out Madison down? No, he doesn't have the chance. A little bit further behind, too wide. Oh, just one performance. Wayne Burke trying to get around Dane Warwick. Can he get that run? Yes, he can. Hampstead gets himself up into third. Two car breakaway at the front of the field. And it's a clean start. Yeah, problems for two other TTL cars in the back, though. Griffin Gardner and Nick Cummings both uh, spinning at turn two. And there's a problem. Ethan Griggold apparently stopped. Oh, he's around. My goodness. Ethan Griggold, an absolutely horror start for him. What on earth happened? Look at that. Too wide. My goodness. Oh, goodness. Alders Esports involved in a big, big incident coming down the back stretch. That is an awfully... Uh, close gaggle of cars there all tripping over each other trying to find some room sam blacklock finding himself in 20th there my goodness what has gone wrong for these guys altus have really not had the start that they wanted it all checked up and everyone was seeing burton slowing down and muggleton slowing down and everyone else and for every man and his neighbor slowed down but at the moment look at brett loxton fighting for the race lead for the reigning champion jared yes. Filsa. he goes to the outside trying to make the move but he can't quite get there get in there son that's what you like to see how do you make your name against the big boys you try and go for race moves and that's what a way to start the season here first racing lap completed that's that's the first race this season to go entirely green from the start excellent stuff richard hamstead with a bit of a lock up into turn one facing a bit of pressure from madison down as chris coxhead is there in the pits not sure what's going on there but brett loxton you can see is really pressuring oh, jared Wilson for this trouble. league trouble trouble emily jones gets turned at turn number one and that was with contact with sam blacklock burton was there on the outside trying to run emily jones went a little bit deep and really it was a case of two into one doesn't go and she's now shuffled all the way back in the pack she'd made nine positions off of the start she had a stormer a barnstormer of a start but ultimately it didn't quite pay off now look at dane warren here trying to attack cooper webster in the battle for sixth position he dives down to the inside at the third chicane and he gets it all stopped and sorted cooper was sitting up on the outside nowhere to go and now maloney will try and take advantage great move from dane warren we are going to get a motum simulation replay of the start right here for you right now thank you very much to motum for this and while we're taking a look at this replay at the start can i just oh, point out oh, oh my god oh my god we might have to abandon that replay richard hamstead has just spun coming out of the hairpin i'm very sorry but my goodness that is the weirdest thing in the world he smacked the brakes that looks technical i think his brakes jam as he tried to get going and he's now reversed himself off of the circuit i think you've got to call a safety car there because that was very very dangerous richard hamstead's brakes i think are completely gone and i think you have to throw a caution there because he's really not too far off of the racing circuit so hamstead with a massive massive moment in the early stages of this event it will still stay oh. green at the moment as this one continues Ouch. but my goodness that was failure of the brakes they jammed shut
Absolutely, and Richard Hamstead is still at a standstill on the exit of the hairpin, wheel jostling from side to side. He's trying to get that issue sorted out. Still no caution, but uh, we will await confirmation from race control on what to do about that. But um, while this race continues to go, I do want to point out we have live timing. If you want to keep up with the timing of the event, you're on YouTube, go down into the description. There's a link to a live timing page there so you can follow along with all the action. We'll just get another quick motor replay of what happened uh, on safety the car. start to Sean safety Kelly. Safety car has come out. Confirmed. A safety car has come out then. And that is, of course, for Richard Hamstead, who's still been unable to get going. That was a late call with the traffic that was coming along. And now this race will slow down. So two laps of great running. Issues for Hamstead has caused oh. the safety car to come out. But my goodness me, this will budge this field back up. And if they need any more of a powder keg, this is going to be it at the moment. They're still battling here. I don't think that they've all got the message here because there's almost contact in the back. And that was Dean O'Brien with Corey Preston and Kyle Stokes. Stop battling, boys. The caution's been thrown. Yeah, well, it's, we're getting some replays of what caused Ethan Grigg Gold's tr uh, troubles. Jake Burton trying to go up the inside and just tagged him there. I think Burton may have overshot the braking zone, just tagging Grigg Gold in the rear. Or did he get contact from the rear, did Burton? We're going to take a look at this one. In a battle with, uh, I believe that. Why are they battling? Warren? They're on the caution, oh, for goodness sake, and they're off. And now into Anderson, I think one of the oldest oh, wow. cars have gone. Um, and I believe that is Sam Blacklock. I don't think they've all got the message here. It's a caution, it's a safety car, and they've all got to slow right down. And I don't think they've all got the message here. They're scrapping it out together. There's more carnage, oh, there's even on, more in the nice. old foggy as well. And my goodness, there'll be some very heavy penalties that will come out after this. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the the, sa the safety car messages on the InSim text chat would have been visible to everybody, but I tell you what, that's really disappointing to see that uh, the drivers were not heeding the warning. That was, uh, oh my goodness, Ethan Warren. That ended up happening because of Nicole Foggy going into his rear. Uh, safety car messages being repeated. But, uh, my goodness, this is not the kind of action that we wanted to see. No, and it is very, very silly racing uh, that we've got. And confirmation coming in. Richard's pedals, Richard Hampstead's pedals have not managed to make that happen. So that was not ideal for him, a complete failure. And that's why he's stuck on the outside. So now the field will stack up like this. Phil Cell leads this one, Loxton in second. Third position is Madison Down, who needed that uh, caution to come out. Dane Warren's up into fourth. Great run from him. Fifth position from Ian Ford, Jake Maloney sixth, Cooper Webster seventh. Then it is Wayne Burke. Forzan El Nabi finds himself in ninth, with Josh Muggleton now rounding out the top ten, as everything seemingly has run into issues. So right now, it's just a case of, I think, a lot of people, Ethan Warren especially, Nicole Foggy especially, will be incredibly frustrated at the way that this one has gone. And both of them, I think, have to feel like this race has completely gone awry. People not heeding to the new rules, to the safety car rules, and they have to be responsive to that. If they hear safety car, Reese, they've got to go and stop because that is safety car, no ifs, no buts, no ands. And I have to say, if that was real racing, then my goodness, I don't think we'd see many more people racing again. Yeah, certainly not. That's um, that's very disappointing to see, but we are under safety car at the moment. Um, chances that the messages were over the wrong channel because I'm seeing reports that, uh, that not everyone was able to get the message of the safety car the first time. Not quite sure. Well, that's one of the small kinks that need to be ironed out at the start of the season. So uh, a few issues then in the early goings. But take a look at who's been making positions. The man who started in split two, Ryan O'Sullivan, is in 12th position up 10 off the start of this race. What a powder keg start he's had. Yeah, certainly has. Excellent start from him. Really impressive to see, especially considering that uh, that there was so much carnage in these opening laps. Really takes uh, a certain type of head on a certain type of shoulders that uh, to to avoid all that sort of stuff. 
It certainly does. And while well, they've got to make sure that they just survive through, it's a 58 lap race. Two pit stops are going to have to be required over the course of this one. But this first pit stop window becomes very, very important. They haven't gone long at all. Only five laps over the course of this one. So for the time being, at least, Phil Cell knows what he needs to do. He just needs to tick off laps and make sure that all the pressure behind him seemingly just fades away. But he has been pretty much matched in the opening stages by Brett Loxton, who wanted to take the fight to Phil Cell. And right now, that KRF car is probably looking the best of the lot here in this entirety of the field. Yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm really interested to see uh, what Brett Loxton can do from, uh, from this position, because uh, you got to remember, um, Phil Cell is going to be the one under the control uh, that, that's going to have the field under his control, my apologies. So Loxton really needs to be on it here, see if Phil Cell can uh, get a good start and if he can follow him. Yes, and it's about that following uh, message that they've got to get. Question is, though, no takers on pit road. I think pit road is closed for the time being, and it is very much exit closed. So yeah, that will mean that the next time they go by, this will be a green flag run. And now for Jared Philsell, after one caution that's come along, he's now just got to get back into the rhythm here. Down Warren, I think, probably the big worry in this field. He's up four positions off the start, and he's probably the only Ultras car that's had any good fortune to begin with. Yeah, definitely seems that way. He's uh, um, still running very well in fourth position, but uh, I think the, the fortunes of his teammates are going to start putting a bit of a damper on that. It's, uh, it hasn't been a good round for the team otherwise, uh, apart from Warren's fourth place. That is very, very true, but... You look at some of the losers in this one. Richard Hamstead has been one of them. Luke Harvey's managed to get in late, but a lap down on the rest of the field. So uh, not the way that Luke Harvey wanted to start this one from 21st. Some of the other big gainers is Michael Healy. He's up 15 places in the opening stages. He's done a good job in the early goings. But as everyone now needs to calm this one down, this is going to be a very interesting safety car resumption here, Reese. What are you expecting? I'm expecting there to be a few more bits of contact throughout the field in these first couple of turns. Because there's uh, a few guys that are out of position to where they should be, thanks to uh, those incidents when the safety car first came out. They'll be looking to make good on them. We're going to see some moves being made. Safety car confirmation from Chief Steward Michael Koroleff. It will be in lead that. The, the leader of the race, of course, Jared Philsell. Jared will control the speed of the field when it comes to the final chicane. The safety car will be able now to pull away and move away, being controlled by Simon Mazomo, the pace car operative. And he's doing a good job, actually, uh, for the work that has been done. But now it's about Brett Loxton. How can he push himself forward? How will he be able to get himself into this next position? Madison Down is experienced with these restarts. It is officially four different vehicles inside of the top four, four different teams, ERT, KRF, TTR, and Altus to go as we have a few redresses before the rest, uh, race start as well. Didn't quite catch who that was. That was a little bit further down in the order, but pace was going to be about Jared Philsell. So now here comes the big moment. When does he decide to go? Under the Dodge Bridge, does he go early here or does he do uh, the big situation that Ross Rizzo did and wait for after the chicane? Does he decide to gun it? He guns it and he guns it good as well. Ooh, and he gets yeah. himself a good six car length advantage as they make their run to turn number one with Green once again at Gilles Villeneuve. And Loxton holds off then in the scrap for second. And he looks into turn number one. Answer to that one is no. Nobody in a position to make overtakes. Yeah, and rightly so, I think. This isn't going to be uh, some kind of crazy start in the first couple of turns, but wait till they get to the uh, the next couple. Uh, you can see Phil Cell has uh, already started to lose a tiny bit of ground to Loxton up the front. You can see Brett is now right on the back of him once again. Very impressive. 
Completely contrasting lines though through turn number six. And as such, Hillsell just gains a bit more of an advantage as now these packs are starting to close up a little bit more. Ryan O'Sullivan on the back of Joshua Anderson who got a massive piece of the accident that happened earlier on. His vehicle looks a little worse for wear. He's thinking of the inside right now of Josh Muggleton. Muggo up eight off of this start. And oh, big wiggle coming from Anderson trying to get on the power as they make their way to the hairpin. Eddie looks at the front of the field for the moment. That's no, but Dane Warren's probably the closest to the lot here. He's all swarming over the back of Madison Down. We will get some draft. Yes, indeed. As we take a look at Michael Cracknell versus... Oh, goodness me. That's uh, versus himself almost. That was not uh, very optimal for him. Now facing big pressure from Healy. But uh, Michael being the guy he is just pulling out of that one. Mr. Cracknell, on the other hand, well, really shaping up. And Sam Blacklock zooms into the pits. Yes, yeah, Sam Blacklock decides he's going to come down into the pits. Cooper Webster, though, very slow off the exit. And that's a slow down penalty, I believe, as he gets himself back going now behind Ryan O'Sullivan. So Cooper Webster's having a shoddy day at the office here. He wanted a little bit better, but he's not quite finding it. So for the time being, at least, Phil Cell leads this one. Loxton second. It's down and Warren. Third and fourth, fifth and sixth currently held by Ian Ford and Jake Maloney as Warren looks at the outside at turn number six. He is desperate for a way through on oh. Madison down. And look how close they are. Yeah, and Brett Loxton with a big oversteer moment on that corner there. He's lost a bit more ground to Phil Sell that uh, he wouldn't have wanted to lose. And now down. Oh, almost getting into the bumper there of Brett Loxton. This is high pressure stuff at the moment. Warren down, Loxton and Phil Sell. That's four different teams in the top four. That is awesome to see here. It is, but look at how Phil Sell's pulling away. A little bump being given by the Ford of uh, Dane Warren's just behind though. Big issues for Muggleton. And there goes through Webster. There goes through O'Sullivan. Up positions. That was uh, Muggleton trying to get it on the brakes. He made contact with Cooper Webster. Drifts it around the corner and gets going. But all of a sudden, Ryan O'Sullivan is up in the top 10 or was. And look at this. Muggleton's going to try and take the advantage. But he has to back out of it because O'Sullivan moves across slightly to make sure that doesn't happen. And now look at how much this oh. is going to Look at Dane. You're absolutely right. Down the inside. Uh, Madison down defends and keeps the position. Yeah, it's getting very heated up there in the top four. You can tell that Dane Warren is really looking to stamp his name on this podium. Madison down with a bit of damage to his front. He is going to be facing some issues. Red Loxton has come alive once again. It seems he's very strong in that first half of the circuit. Just starting to catch up a little bit to Jared Philsell once again. Yes, that's what we're starting to see here. Maybe an ebb and flow feel. Ian Ford has now gone on the hook to the back of this battle for second position out on the road. And that's going to be an interesting little look. There's maybe a bit further down. Scott Soslowski in this scrap. Dino Bryan, Corey Preston, Ethan Brink Gold all of the sudden is finding himself in 26th position trying to recover through the field not how he wants to start his championship Corey Preston one of the hardest battlers out there in the field and this is just the case of how do I do it and when do I do it against Preston yeah that's exactly it Ethan uh, looking uh, like he's got an all right exit there and he's going to go straight for the move on the inside but he's not far up enough Preston though sees him coming and goes wide He's got a bit of traction on the exit, but it looks like uh, Ethan was just able to get it down a little bit faster. Will Preston try to put a move back? I doubt it. No, I don't think he will as they make their way to the final chicane. And crucially on that last lap, Brett Loxton marginally quicker than Jared Philsell has been able to just abstain that gap just a little bit as now they're just trying to find a bit of ease. Jake Burton, for example, and he's been involved a lot so far today. He's trying to get past Josh Muggleton uh, to find a way through and ultimately he cannot quite do it at this stage. So. Burton, he's going to try and make that move, and he's not able to try and get by just yet as they head through three and four and into five and six in this backfield section. And a lot of lockups and breaks a little bit further forward in that pack as well, as there is uh, one driver who has managed to uh, be stopped on track. Didn't quite catch who it was, but they are able to escape and we stay green.
Yes, indeed. We certainly do. So, at the moment, uh, it seems it might have been uh, might have been foggy. Not quite sure. But uh, Dan Warren versus Madison Down confirmed. Yes, it was foggy. This is looking quite hectic. Down, Warren, and Ford all together in a line coming through the hairpin. And uh, Warren having to run just a little wide on entry to the hairpin. This is looking like a battle that could go on for quite some time. A very, very long time indeed. Look at the pack in the background though. Is Dean O'Brien gets a massive wiggle and that checks up Preston and taking advantage of that is Kyle Stokes for ERT making a way through. Nick Cummings on the recovery as well. He's going to try and find himself uh, attacking but ultimately no dice. They make their way through. Great run from Burton though. He will try and get past Muggleton. Positive sim racing trying to find a way past his former team of Trans Tasman and Josh Muggleton's not going to give him an inch here runs a little bit deep into turn one able to gather it back up through two yes they're losing time to Ryan O'Sullivan but that won't matter one bit no certainly not these guys are racers through and through they love to race far more than anything else so Muggo and Burton still managing to keep it clean through that section good to see you can see how much Drivers are pushing as we ride on board with Michael Cracknell. He's just behind the likes of, of Burton and Muggo. These guys just dipping wheels into the grass every so often, using as much curb as they can, running the white line to within an inch of, uh, of the track limits. It's absolutely that, incredible to see. And that track limit is so, so vital here because they understand how much they need to fight. They have to remember as well, too many incidents and they will accrue one penalty point for every incident they find themselves over here. Too many incident points over and that will be race bans. And we've seen six drivers um, not find themselves racing, four of which would have been fantastic here today. Jackson Seuss Linhardo, uh, you've got Jordan Ross, you've got Thomas McMillan and Brady Myers who would have all been top 10 candidates. Yeah, certainly, but then would we see the same kind of scintillating battles that we are seeing at the moment, like with Warren and Down, we ride on board with Dane Warren, you see the hump of the Ford Falcon V8 just under the bonnet, a good aiming device for putting this thing into corners, big entry gains from Warren and he's able to sort of maintain it on exit but not quite you can definitely tell that uh, Warren is more confident in the ability of his car to slow down he certainly is and oh both of them getting mighty tight to the wall as they head through four and run themselves to five Dane Warren trying to be the aggressor here trying to open up and prize a, an opportunity out of Madison down but is simply not finding anything that is helpful in any way shape or form is stuck at this two tenth barrier has the little feint to the inside at eight and nine and still not quite there maybe a great run coming off of here's going to be where he's going to have to do it and this is where he's, he's going to have to try get down the inside of the hairpin that might be the best place for the slowdown oh. Paramount to the killer, and there's one position gone, and all of a sudden, Dane's in a battle with Maloney, Burke, and El Narby. Oh no, that's a big shame for Warren from fourth down to fifth. I tell you what, he does have the pace to try and gap these guys, I'm sure, especially if they're battling amongst themselves, but he will be very frustrated behind the wheel of that Altus Falcon. Yes, and that Altus Falcon is not going to be happy at all. Actually, an Altus Ford uh, is definitely not going to be happy at all. So for the moment, at least, Jared Philsell leads this event, but the gap has extended and has gone over a second for the first time. Now this is the worrying stage. It's breakaway central for Philsell, and this is what he loves to do best, just work away a one-second gap. And then once one second's there, it's run for the hills as much as possible. Maybe the toughest uh, field ever he's had to try and run a second away from but my goodness me are we seeing some great battling Ryan O'Sullivan though is the man under pressure because there is Cracknell right on the back Anderson still finds himself there and only a couple of seconds back is Michael Healy trying to bring the next train along yes indeed S starting to see the drivers um, divide off into their own battle packs here as as um, K 
chaos reigns supreme and then calms down into order. O'Sullivan seems to be stronger in the rear half of the circuit. You see he's got a bit of a gap on Muggleton and Burton, and Burton trying desperately to find some way to get by Muggleton. I think he knows uh, he has been a regular top 10 contender in Scops over the past season. He wants to make good on that once again. He certainly does, and while he is mighty close to trying to make that happen, he's not quite, though, in the wheelhouse get that move done. Look a little forward because Wayne Burke's got a good run here on Jake Maloney. If he can pick it up, he could dive down the inside and take that away here, lap 13 of 58, and just not in a position to go and make that move happen. So he'll have to just sit and play that patience waiting game. And this is where drivers are starting to think, track position, because fuel savings mighty important, but also getting onto this pit road is mighty important. Just ask Lee, as a big wiggle from Burton coming off the final chicane, will not give him a chance against Muggo at turn one. No, certainly not. And these guys still continuing to fight as hard as they ever have. Having a look at um, the likes of Maloney, etc. down here as we see Corey Preston on the pit road himself. Yeah, and that's the first positive decision that's been made in this event. An early call by Corey Preston to dive down onto pit road, take his service and get back out and going again. So we hit that early window. And what he does by coming in on lap 13, he's got two long stints now to go to the end of this event. And that's going to be the big telling factor. He will gain a massive undercut on everyone in this field, but he will lose time in the stops later on in this event. Yeah, he certainly will. That's uh, something that's got to be taken into account. But who knows, maybe the longer runs will help Preston, especially if he doesn't come out in traffic. Meanwhile, the, the fight with uh, Maloney, Burke and El Nabi is continuing to rage on here. Warren has really gapped these guys, but they're still making life uh, a little troublesome for each other. They are, and Wayne Burke is just keeping calm here. Oh, no, trying to get himself through. Look at this. Hard defense. Oh, Contact no. between the pair of them. No love lost between former teammates. Josh Muggleton is defending with his life at the moment. I think the stewards will have to get involved here because they are battling far too hard for the early stages of this event. Well, I, yeah, I, I'd say that they are battling a bit hard, but I don't think the stewards should get involved. It's hard racing, but it's still just racing. If something ends up happening and the two of them take each other out, that's when the stewards ought to have a look at it. These guys, you can certainly tell, even for a position like 10th and 11th, they are not willing to put anything on the line. I think it runs a little deeper with that because Jake Burton did leave Trans Tasman and there was a lot of people that were leaving Trans Tasman racing. I think Josh Muggleton is fighting more than just to save a position. I think he's fighting almost to prove that he's better than Jake Burton. He maybe feels like he was lost a little bit in 2018 when it was Jake Burton's time to pick up a position. But now Rhino Sullivan, who's been on the back of all of this, is probably slower than these two at the moment. Now this is where it's starting to get interesting in that little mini scrap that we have been seeing out on track. And still, they look to try and run for a chance at La Pangle, the hairpin. And for the moment, it seems Rhino Sullivan just holds the advantage. Yep, certainly does. Now, we will see on this next run how Muggleton and Burton compare. You can see Burton, he, he wants that slipstream. He wants the run. A bit more of a distance between himself and Muggo this time, so there won't be any uh, tagging of rear bumpers in a straight line. But wait for the chicane. Looks like Burton's just holding back there, and he's actually going to the pits. Yeah, and you know what? That with Burton, I think that's the reason why he was trying so hard to get by Muggleton. He wanted a clear run into the pit lane, and he didn't get one. No, he didn't, and I think that's a very good call there by Jake Burton. Get out of the traffic. He knew he wasn't getting past Muggleton easily. I'll do it in strategy call, and that will be the way that I will come across and try and pick up anything that I possibly can. So good call, I think, there from Burton as he looks to try and 
be the aggressor and push. All of a sudden, though, gap at the front of the field extends. 2.2 seconds and right now between Phil Sell and Loxton. Loxton only 1.4 clear here of Madison down, but they are matching times at the moment, which is the big key factor to this one. The fact that they are able to hold these times together is paramount to how this race is going to be panning out. Got another good little scrap in the background as Carl Stokes tries to find a way past Emily Jones. This for 23rd position on the road. Yes, indeed. These guys. Ooh, slow down. Oh. Yeah, James Scott, bit of a slowdown there. So that's going to be another position for both Jones and Stokes. That's going to be interesting to us uh, to see. Meanwhile, Wayne, um, Dane Warren has just lost three spots. Not quite sure why. Dare I say another slowdown? Yes. Absolutely correct. Slow down central here at Circuit Gilles Villeneuve in Montreal. So Warren now is behind El Nabi and Maloney and Ryan O'Sullivan also finds himself in slow down central. He will lose out to Michael Cracknell, who goes down the inside and will pick up another position to boot too. So it seems that positions are going left and right at the moment. No takers this lap then onto pit road. And I'm not surprised because you've got to be a long time coming to make sure that that strategy call is going oh, to be so in play. And oh. Wow, he's, he's still got that nervous rear end from split one, Sperry. He's having trouble. He's got the nervous rear end. He held it together, but maybe those nerves are a little bit more jangly. And again, he has a little bit of a slide trying to get on the brakes and a big one off the exit. And now surely Joshua Anderson's got to think about how do I get by to go plus eight on my day on the brakes into the left of six and seven. And he's not quite able to pick that up and get going. Look who's on the back of all of this, though. Ethan Grigolt is up to 17th and is having a very good recovery drive. Next up, oh, hello, former teammate Simon Feigl. Yes, indeed. And Ethan, a really, uh, really large uh, ground that he has to make up here. He's still keeping it nice and smooth, but tell you what is uh, his laps through the race actually taking a look at them he's been dipping more and more into the 36s over the last few laps so i think he's really struggling to try and get the pace as we take a look at o'sullivan and anderson once again this time out of the hairpin so down to the final chicane they go now which one of these guys will be wanting to pit first is my question anderson has the best advantage from being in the front but they are still taking the final chicane once again. And that fight just up ahead of them looks mighty spicy between uh, Josh Muggleton and uh, Michael Cracknell. Yes, and Michael Cracknell at the moment just tried to think about going down the inside. He couldn't quite get past Muggo. And that's going to have to be a long, long wait as they continue on in this one. Healy, Mickey, uh, Feigl and Greg Galt all there, all looking to scrap this one out and gain as many positions as they can. Four car scrap behind Jake Maloney as well. Keep an eye on this. Wayne Burke has been searching lap after lap. He's been soul searching for overtakes. And at the moment, not even a spirit medium could help him find a soul at the moment. He has been struggling that much. Slightly defensive line taken in towards seven. And that one very nicely done by Maloney, who picks up a good run. But it's the exit trying to be held by Wayne Burke, which doesn't have the ability to run that, that third chicane there, Reese, which gives him the chance to attack at Lapangle. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that you've got to think about here at Montreal. There's so much flow between these corners. If you mess up one, that's half your lap gone. So the drivers have to really be careful about that. Wayne Burke has not gotten the exit that he would have wanted from the hairpin. He has got a little bit of a slipstream, but I don't think he is far up enough to make a Banzai move, especially at this point in the race. Maloney, you saw, though, covered him off slightly. He knows what the trouble is, and he's decided to go into the pits. Yes, and I think he understood that, okay, I'm under pressure. He might try and make a move here sooner rather than later. So he decides it's time to come down in. It's time to make that call on lap 18 of 58. So he'll have maybe two 20 lap stints left to go if he wants to make this one work for himself. So that's a good decision, I think, a good call. Splitting the splits, splitting the strategy might be the way to go out and take this race. But of course, drivers can go all the way up, I think, to about lap 22 or so and have a really short run to the end. 
Yeah, that seems like a good idea. That's one of the things that you need to think about in a race like this is um, there are two pit stops that are basically required, not, not mandatory per se, but the fuel restriction basically enforces it. You have to pit twice during this race. The question is, which of your stints is going to be the short and sweet one? Sweet has got to be going. Slow down comes in for Joshua Anderson. He drops back uh, behind Michael Healy and now just ahead of Mickey and Greg Gold having this scrap. So Craig Merritt racing. CMR team looking to have this nice little battle that goes on. And for the moment, uh, sorry, Chris Merritt racing. At the moment, Ethan Greg Gold just not in the position to try and get himself uh, going forward. Look at Borzan Anabi though, just a little bit further in front. He's uh, lost it out. Oh, he is up front at the moment because look at this. He's got past Wayne Burke. Burke struggling then as they head into the whoa! final hairpin. And oh my goodness me. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Issues. Dane Warren with a big lunge, but he can't quite get it and he loses one for his troubles. Wow. I, I, have, I, I am lost for words there. That could have ended very badly. I think Warren just uh, misjudged the braking zone slightly. But, uh, oh my goodness, that is not going to work out well for him. Replay from Modem Simulation up on screen right now. Let's have a look at what happened. So he put, he put, the, brakes, he put the brakes on just slightly, but then let off them. That's interesting. I think he knew that he was going to lock up and spin if he held the brake, so he had to release it in order to keep himself going through the corner. And just like that, two positions lost by having no exit speed whatsoever. At the moment, though, it's the battle for second, third, and fourth that needs to be focused on because Brett Loxton has not gone away from Madison Dam. They've been lapping almost to the thousandth of a second. Five thousand split them that last time by. And at the moment, Madison Dam's got to worry about a Ford known as Ian. Down the inside, he looks in the Evolution Racing Team car. Two on the podium for the moment, but now they're going to go too wide. And if I was Madison, this may be the perfect time to come down onto the lake. Yeah, probably. I would have to say that is a really good call, Sperry. What will Madison actually do, though? We'll see. He's got uh, Ford on the inside. Madison down getting on the brakes. Not quite late enough to get into the pits. So he is continuing to stay out. Mm. Wonder if uh, wonder if that was the right decision. I wonder as well. But two come in. One is El Narby. The other is Wayne Burke. Both of them looking to have a good stop to get in and out without too many worries at all in the early stages. Now we're starting to see the cycle as Michael Cracknell decides it's time to go in as you were. Yeah, Chris Coxhead uh, getting an amazing run there out of the hairpin. And, oh, have a look at that. That was an Evolution Racing Team key, uh, car going into the pits. Next to him, Emily Jones with a bad run. And James Scott coming in to the pits as well. Carl Stokes, too. So the pit lane is coming alive as we enter the 20s in laps. Yes, and now it's about where do you come out in comparison because right now that is looking at the rear of the field at the moment one driver who is to go through all of this at the moment is jake maloney he pitted a little bit earlier off with the lane comes forwards and el narby as he looks to try and get through and el narby clearly ahead of wayne burke but look at how much jake maloney has jumped he did this remember reese at the final round last year at road america i mm. think maloney he plays that card right could be a little bit annoying for the likes of phil cell loxton and down they've got to be careful about what he does yeah they certainly do got to keep an eye on jake maloney there but uh, that is a story that will develop over the course of this race we still look at madison down and ian ford battling down the back stretch and madison down continuing to stay out and fight with ian ford these guys very close on track right now and uh, ford i think is really uh enjoying being able to save a bit of fuel behind down I think he is and I think he's loving it right now as the way that he just is able to usurp a little bit more out of the fuel tank than others. Cooper Webster has got himself back up into bit. He's battling it out with Dane Warren at the moment as there are two takers on the lane. One is Ryan O'Sullivan, the other is Eaton Grig Galt. ERT strategy comes into play. Chris Coxhead as well decides his time on the lane. Sean Kelly also comes on. So right now, firmly in this pit stop window. Yes, indeed. So Kelly, we'll see how he does from that position as he goes down the order. 
Down and forward though, the main people we're focusing on at the moment on track in terms of fighting. These guys have been locked together for the last few laps. Down still carrying a bit of damage from the start. So this is going to be a bit of a a bit of a race defining decision I think for Madison down this decision to stay out and continue battling with Ford because I'm not sure what he's going to be able to do in the second half of the race to try and gap it well it's not the case of gapping him it's the fact that Madison I don't think has the pace overall to really go out there and make a worldy of a decision to keep himself forward just look at some who have come down in and made stops and got themselves back going again Wayne Burke for example has got Jake Burton just behind him and Corey Preston is ahead of Forzan El Nabi of all people and now look at Forzan try and attack him yes indeed so Corey Preston uh versus Forzan El Nabi here we're being told that uh, Preston had a very short pit stop actually taking a look it was a 10.3 second stop when usually we've been seeing guys with pit stops in the 20s in terms of seconds so there we go that's going to be that done i believe uh preston letting el Nabi go i think we might see him fall down the order a bit as i'm hearing madison down got a slow down and ian ford's in front very much in front so madison down pays the price by having a slow down penalty and Ian Ford can now run and try and chase down Brett Loxton next and that was not part of Madison's plan as he drops backwards into fourth position Cooper Webster currently in fifth Dane Warren now in sixth position and he himself has dropped a fair distance too so a lot of drivers struggling then in the early goings of this one as we do have two wide and that was Greg Galt having a scrap with Sam Blacklock through the final chicane they held it too wide there was no yielding from either party and it was blacklock going far too deep and getting all over the curb no contact between them great car control but blacklock nearly found himself with a grid gold in the wall of champions yeah goodness me it's getting mighty uh, mighty hectic in the midfield here but Grig gold is continuing to hold station at the front of this pack he's got um the oh, Cracknell O'Sullivan in. Anderson battle in front of him. Yes, indeed. And three of the four come in from the front. Loxton is one of them. Ford is the second. Madison down is the third. All on lap 23 of this event with Jared Philsell staying out at the front of this one. Now you've got to be perfect into your box and make sure you put all the right numbers in for the fuel and for the tyres and everything else that you have to be fighting with. Also in is Dane Warren. Josh Muggleton has decided to come in. James McKee is also in on the lane, as comes in Marlon McMullen in for his stop too. So the question becomes who will come out first and where in all of this will be that fantastic driver that has been making great progress through the field jake maloney so maloney at the moment over the start finish line he goes and crucially he gets a big jump over the likes of brett loxton so up into second position but i think jared bilsell may have just run himself out ahead of maloney and is clear through the wayside yeah, definitely seems that way. Phil Cell's just come out onto the back straight now, so uh, it looks like he's still going to have that advantage of the lead when he comes out from his pit stop. But all these guys that have just taken theirs, um, they're going to have to get back into the rhythm. So Wayne Burke finds himself here behind Ian Ford. And Both of these guys have pitted. Yep, they have, and that's some great strategy by Wayne Burke to get himself back through. Madison down, the big loser in all of this. He's now behind Burke, and behind him is former teammate uh, Jake Burton. But in comes the reigning champion, Jared Philsell, to come in and make the stop that he needs to make. So for the first stops, that's lap 25 he's managed to go to. But look who's going even longer. It's Cooper Webster. I think he's going to try and outrun everybody on fuel to win this one. And if you look at how long this race is, it's 58 laps worth of action. And you need to go to about lap 29 to make yourself get all the way through. I doubt that he'd be able to do that well compared to everyone else. But what he will do is get a lap on the rest of the field. And then he'll be able to make that stop good. 
Nilsa will take a little while in his stop, but for the moment at least, final corner comes along for Jake Maloney as he will try and get himself uh, pushing forward. Long stop, I think it's coming in. Phil Phil off down. the jacks and away he goes. But look at this. He's going to come out with Griffin Gardner, of all people, who could slow down and help Maloney out. No, doesn't manage to make that happen. Maloney, though, is in second, and that's the big news. Yeah, certainly. Great jump there by Maloney, but we'll have to wait and see how the rest of his race pans out, what kind of compromises he is going to have to make to get himself to the finish in that position. May not e ever uh, end up like that for him, but we'll have to wait and see. Phil Selvo out in front. This was uh, the story of quite a few races of his last season when he was still at Trans-Tasman, and uh, it seems like more business as usual now that he's at Evolution Racing Team. Very much so. Another massive loser is Dane Warren. He's down all the way in 24th position. Just got by Simon Feigl for position. So now he's got to play the recovery game. Carl Stokes, the next that he needs to get by. Michael Healy as well has got out ahead of him. So this first stop has really shuffled up the field. Ethan Grigg Gold is up into 18th position. But look at just in front. There is uh, Dean O'Brien, I think, under pressure from Josh Anderson. Oh, they're almost into each other. They hold it together. And now Ryan O'Sullivan's got to think about how he makes the moves. Yes, indeed. Remember, split two winner Ryan O'Sullivan. So he knows how to make up positions. You can see... Uh, Nick Cummings at the front of this train. Have a look at them all go through the hairpin like that, like a train. That's insane. Barely anything between these guys. 13th all the way down to 18th, these drivers are fighting. And uh, at the moment, it seems like Anderson is uh, the fastest out of all of them. I think he is right now, and he's desperate to find a way through. Cooper Webster has been down on the lane for a long time, and he will come out with a full tank of fuel in his vehicle behind Jake Burton by a fairly big distance but crucially in front of Nick Cummings and the train that he's got at the back of it Ethan Greg Galt scything away down the inside uh, there of Michael Cracknell in the KRF car and very easily making that position count so Greg Galt's just got to check him off one at a time easy job though is Ryan O'Sullivan left as now Loxton goes purple trying to chase down. He's caught Jake Maloney, and right now he has to because he's got no other alternatives out on track. Yeah, certainly. This is um, Loxton's best shot at a second place. I think he's uh, he's lost touch with Phil Self for now. He's going to have to make good on this one. Maloney, though, looking very much in control at the hairpin. Loxton trying his best to get that run, and he's actually managed to draw almost level with Jake Maloney in terms of throttle application, and this could be a move coming into the chicane. You can see Loxton with the run. He's going to pull out and go alongside. Is Maloney going to yield to him? Actually, yeah. yes, he is. Lifts right off and lets him go. And this is the thing with Maloney, he knows that he's on a different race strategy and he's not going to fight with anyone, and that's very, very telling. Forzan El Nabi, though, he's scrapping out with Ian Ford, Madison Down and Wayne Burke going at it together too. So it's packs of two having their own little scraps, but Forzan has been impressive over that stop. Yes, he'll struggle in the longer term, but he has managed to gain some good positions over the likes of Ian Ford. Madison Down, though, will be under pressure, and Wayne Burke, who has victories to his name, wants to try and show he's more than just a one-trick pony. Yep, that's exactly right. And especially with his moving to a new team at one performance, he wants to really show what he's made of now that he is in new colours. So we're right on board with Forzan, looking back at Ian Ford coming into uh, the turn seven and eight chicane. And it's awesome to see a couple of angles of this battle because you can really see what the drivers need to do around this track in order to go fast. Forzan just getting on the brakes a little bit earlier than Ford. And have a look at the amount of two-wheeling going on across those curbs. You can really test the limits of the car suspension around here certainly can and that's what we have been seeing on the brakes into the hairpin once again they come along Ford takes that wider line trying to pick up a run off the exit and my goodness has he done that he's kept himself within a couple of car lengths here so that he's got that opportunity to go out there and really push and attack the next stage of this straight and 
you will now see Borzan dive out of the way of all things there to let him go through. So interesting decision there from Forzan. They're letting Ian Ford go and saying, you know what? I'm probably looking to hit a fuel number. Go and try and push because I'm just going to follow in the tow. Yeah, certainly. That seems to be the way of things. Up the front, um, John Emerson from TTL Esports, who's uh, stayed out the longest out of anyone. Uh, he is currently in the race lead on track, but he's got the effective race leader bearing down on him here. He does, and that is Jared Philsell. So John Emerson, well, you've had some fun leading this event, but how long you will lead it for, I'm not quite too sure. So Emerson will have to be the one to just look out and sit and wait and just see how Phil Cell will close down 10th on 10th but he's gone very well over this stint 28 laps on a tank is no slouch yes they've had that safety car period but they have managed to go really really well and they've probably got to go to about 30 if they want to get this done on one stop I doubt that they'll be able to do so here comes Phil Cell down the inside and he will have no competition from the TTL car and just like that, ERT are back in the front of this one. Stalianchic fighting it out with Loxton. And Loxton cuts him off at the junction and gets away through. Yes, indeed. Now, Michael Taliancic starting uh, pretty much dead last. So this is the kind of strategy that we would expect from him. Leaving it as long as possible. And uh, he has got... Oh, that's definitely going to be a pit stop there from Taliancic. In fact, that's... Uh, probably um, cost Loxton about half a second that would have been very valuable for him. Talk about valuable. Ethan Greg Galt's past Nick Cummings. He has stormed through this pack without any care in the world. And it's almost as if they've all been caught standing because nobody is in a world to try and get through. In is Taliancic. In, of course, as well, is John Emerson. So the field has officially all made one entire pit stop. So Ethan Greg Galt, all of a sudden, now has to think about pushing forward. And his gap that he's looking at is now nine seconds to Jake Burton up in front of him. A long, tall order, but Greg Galt is back to where he started in 10th position albeit disposed of half a race yes indeed and uh, he has one of the um, one of the longer pit stop times out of uh, that first run of pit stops so we can be sure that this stint's going to be a longer one he's going to do a bit of a splash and dash at the end i think if not uh, not take a second pit stop at all and uh, that should definitely bring him back into contention if he can keep this pace up Pace up indeed at halfway stage. Jared Philsell leads this event after 48 minutes of racing. Brett Loxton finds himself in second with Jake Maloney in third position. It's Ian Ford in fourth, disposing of Ford Zano Narby, who's now fifth, falling backwards towards the clutches of Madison Down in sixth position. Seventh is Wayne Burke with eighth being held by Cooper Webster. Ninth is Jake Burton. And it, it, Ethan Grigg got running out the top ten and all indeed, because that is Nick coming. Great train on the outside, and I think, yes, there was contact Crash. with Anderson who looked down to the inside, and I I don't know how to call this one, Reese, because I think if I can just get a look at this one, that was a little bit of a, a long wait to that right-hand side for Cummings, and there was no lane being left for Anderson to attack. Yeah, I, think, I get the feeling like Cummings obviously got onto the brakes a tiny bit early. Maybe he was looking to clear a slowdown, but he was staying in the middle of the track there. And uh, yeah, I, I honestly don't think there was much of a place for Anderson to go. He was already looking to try and go for that move on the inside. And just like that, he will drop more positions, um, Will Nick Cummings, as Dane Warren makes her way through and up into 16th position out on the road. So the middle pack beginning to scrap and claw and battle it out just a little bit further here battle packs of five starting to crop up compared to the single car trains that we are seeing towards the front of the field but for the moment there is one constant jared leads and jared has been very quiet about the way he leads here's rhino sullivan though thinking of a move into the second chicane uh, or third chicane actually and not quite being able to can he pick up a run off the exit i think he's got a chance yeah, definitely seems that way. Anderson carrying a bit of damage now. Staying a bit defensive right in the middle of the road, which makes sense. But uh, you can see O'Sullivan 
was searching for a place to stick his car and try and get a good run out of the hairpin. Anderson covering him off nicely, though. This may be a move at the chicane. Can he get this one done? You will look to the bump. Oh. And he will not get down the inside. He says, no, go quicker. Anderson will go straight on onto pit road and make his second stop of the day. He just about slows it up. He's going to go off kilter with this one. He was happy. And Josh drive Anderson had a drive-through penalty, actually, um, for, I believe, the incident he had with Nick Cummings. And he will now turf that drive-through and go on forward in this race. Disaster for the Vendor Valmar. Yeah, absolutely. That's not what you want. And behind him, Cummings has just come into the pits, possibly to repair that damage. We look at Scott Sislovsky at the moment, uh, and out on track at the moment. Once again, for Trip Sim Sports, he is chasing down, I believe that's Burke. That's Dean O'Brien, actually, Dino there, Brian, my apologies. Uh, in the 96. And he's trying to go the long way around to try and make that move not quite in a position to get that one working but Michael Healy's a teammate just behind and the trick team is starting to push forward and they are starting to look at maybe trying to make a concerted effort to get by this Dean O'Brien machine big lock up further forward though and that's Dane Warren who is not having the best of days and he'll have to serve the slow down to boot that's his big problem turn for Dane Warren. At that particular chicane, that's the third time we've seen in this race. He's made a mistake there and he's had to serve the penalty. So I don't know what's gone wrong for him there, but Warren not having a good time at all. No, he's not. So he'd rather wish he'd get to Interlagos quickly and post haste, or post haste, I should say. But there, Dane Warren now has to start thinking about defensive lines he gets on the brakes into the right left chicane no chance of making a move then on 31 of 58 as just behind Kyle Stokes is getting all over the rear of Michael Healy looking for uh, a bit of a move and no chance just yet then of seeing that one come out in the way that he wants to so on the brakes turn numbers one and two again time of waiting yeah, certainly, especially in that section of the circuit. You don't want to be uh, diving up the inside of anyone through this section because it's very hard to run side by side. It's when you get to the second half of the circuit that you can really start thinking about putting moves on people. Look at Ian Ford in the battle for third. Jake Maloney has been caught, and that's not the surprising point. Big lunge down the inside from the ERT man, and it's going to be met side by side, and there's going to be a good push off of the exit, but a few wiggles about trying to put the power down, and through will go Jake Maloney. Question becomes, will he attack? He's trying to stay out of the draft, maybe, at this stage. Moves to the left-hand side and deliberately is backing off of it here to allow Ian Ford the chance to go through. Hold, please, as the Johnny Brandon, I think, has just been uh, involved in an incident, and it is a safety massive car. one, and it's a safety car, the second one that's been deployed, and now the race turns on a knife edge because this is right in front, that second pit stop window for a lot of drivers. Yeah, it certainly is. So, Johnny Brandon at a standstill. Motum replay once again of what happened here. So, Johnny Brandon you know, just hit the wall on the exit of that chicane, and it seems like it might have broken the steering, or he's had a hardware issue. Oh, well, it's a horrible incident, and it means that both of the... Uh... Uh, the UK crew have struggled here today and they've run themselves into issues but more importantly than all of that though it does mean that this race has changed once more over the course of this one drivers are instantly diving right now to get stops in McMullen, Jones, seen Cummings in I've seen Blacklock, Greg Galt, Wayne Burke has dived down in and picked up a pit stop even Greg Galt's in they're going to try and play the strategy card. They've heard, okay, pitting time. Griffin Gardner as well. And they've got no choice. They've got to come down in and make those stops and get that fuel in. It may be suicide if you don't. So the question becomes, will Phil Cell come in? Will he decide to make that call and come in? Or will he be stuck on the call of doing everything else? Everyone has decided, right, now's the time to dive down in and make a stop. Yes, indeed, and Simon Mazomo and the safety car just uh, coming out of the pits and uh, letting people go who have decided to come in. So there's Loxton coming in. There's Ford and Maloney and El Navi. 
and everyone who accompanies them. Madison down, Cooper Webster going in as well. The pits have not been closed by race control yet, so they, uh, they are taking whatever chance they can. Phil Sell has hit his box and this pace car is going to take a little while before it filters out and gets itself through. Ian Ford is in. Madison Down is in. Brett Loxton is in as the hold continues for Johnny Brandon as everyone is looking to get these stops in. Phil Sell has a very good stop before he gets himself out of the way. Who will be next though to go out of these next three as everything looks to go good and it's Madison Down who's maybe the one who will struggle in terms of comparisons. Webster looking very nice in terms of the way that goes. El Navi stays ahead of Maloney but Madison Down does jump a couple. Yes, indeed, and that's going to be significant for him. Hopefully for him, he'll be able to make good on that. Everyone is now out, and I'm listening to Jared Phil, so there is no sound coming from his engine. He's fuel-saving. Oh, he is massively fuel-saving at the moment, and I'm not surprised he has to. It's lap 34 of 58. It's a full tank that they are going to have to be running towards the end, so anything you can save is going to be huge between now and the end of this event. So... This becomes a pure sprint, and Brett Loxton, who had been very good at being in the draft of Phil Cell, who struggled when he fell out of it, Phil Cell has been equalized once again. But now Ian Ford's going to be in the attacking position. Jake Maloney has now got himself up there. Forzan inside the top five, and it's a whole new race once again. It absolutely is, and this is why we love the fact that, uh, that there are safety cars in V8 Scops. It certainly adds that massive, uh, um, massive randomness to what happens in a race. You can see how drivers react to these events, and uh, you really get to see who has the strategic heads on their shoulders here. Yes, it's that strategy that's going to be good. Nick Cummings is out, but look at how things have changed here and those who have stayed out for track position. Jack Boyd up into ninth position. Brett Cananzi has had a quiet day, and the car of the devil is now in 11. Yeah, definitely seems that way, but um, we'll have to wait and see what he can do in terms of his pit stops. Meanwhile, Chris Coxhead, uh, he has made five pit stops in this race we are hearing. Still in 16th. That's impressive. That's very, very clever from Chris Coxhead. He has buttoned his way back into it as right now pit lane finds itself closed as we are one lap away from going to green flag running phil cell loxton ford down el nabi and then you've got jack boyd now sitting in the sixth position at the moment there have been losers over the course of this one jake burton is one of them look how much ethan grig gold slows right down on the straight as well because he is fuel saving everything possible to try and keep his race alive so now everyone is starting to think well maybe we can't make it over to the end it's going to be so touch and go yeah absolutely you might see a couple of drivers just dive in for a splash and dash on the penultimate lap if that's the case this is going to turn into a fantastic finish michael taliansic in emily jones in as well so uh these drivers taking their pit stops even though they uh, they won't necessarily be able to exit as the exit is closed currently. And Johnny Brandon will very soon be lifted off from the circuit and then the rest of this race will resume. Question becomes though, how aggressive do you be in the early stages? I think if you're Brett Loxton, you've got to attack Phil Cell from minute one. Yeah. There's no uh, other alternative. Yeah. Absolutely. I 100% I agree with you there. Um, Phil Cell... Uh, you can tell he is uh, fuel saving. You can tell that Loxton is fuel saving a bit as well. All these guys just trying to extend their tanks as much as they possibly can. And if if I'm Loxton, I'm making sure that I'm right on it when Phil Cell decides to go at the green flag. The one thing I'm worried about is Johnny Brandon is still on circuit. And I think that needs to be coordinated back to the stewards here because he has yet to get off the track and they are very soon going to go back green again. They're down at the hairpin and he's only at turn number four. So right now, that's the one big worry they've had. They've not told Johnny Brandon, I think, yet to get off and they've just about managed to do that. So for the time being, Phil Cell will have control of the field and Mazomo will pull away in the sim speed safety car 
And for the time being, Evolution Racing Team back in control, but it's KRF. Look at how Brett Loxton just sits on the rear and goes, I'm not scared of you. I'm just going to push and push and push and push you to your very, very limits. And that's what Phil Cell will be looking at and looking to try and do. I think for the moment at least, this is Jared's race to lose. He's had himself control for the majority, if not all, of this race. So for the time being, we will go one further lap at the moment in terms of the safety car race. But pit exit is closed. But pit entry is for Jack Boyd, who will now circle himself right to the back of the pack. Yep, certainly will. And uh, I, uh, that's obviously not the best way to go about it. But I think maybe his hands might have been tied there. I think they were. And Jack Boyd who has looked very, very good in things like AOSC. Uh, he'll be looking to try and get a good run. Also down in, Josh Muggleton deciding he needs to come down and make a stop. So drivers maybe aren't feeling they're secure on their fuel numbers. Another lap, though, under safety drivers car going in. will help. And yes, there is, right at the back, because they don't have really here, Reese anything to lose by coming down and making that stop, because they'll have everything they need to go out and push again. Yeah, that's very true. So uh, Blacklock and uh, Feigl in the pits. Preston still at a standstill. Sean Kelly making his exit. Griffin Gardner making his exit as well. So these guys all looking to have one final go at getting some kind of good result in this one with uh, effectively one full tank to go. One full tank and a bit more. Brett Cananzi is in eighth position. Blake Purdy, we haven't talked anything about him today. He's inside the top ten as this start will go through, but expect them to maybe drop a little bit further backwards as we have got ourselves green flag racing coming soon. Jared Phil Cell certainly the leader, and at the moment it has to be Ian Ford maybe the big worry factor at this one. Loxon's got to go aggressive. We saw he got jumped well, and right now Madison down probably needs to be the one that pushes forward. Reese, what's your thoughts heading to the next green flag run? It's going to be exactly the same from Loxton. He has to be right on it from the first millisecond of that run. What he needs to be certain of is when Phil Cell makes that jump because we've seen him change it up a little bit. Uh, he's, uh, he's gone right in the middle of the chicane, which is kind of un unexpected. So have to wait and see ian ford look out for him because uh, you can see he's off to the side there and making sure that he is well within the mirrors of both loxton and his new teammate yes and now you have to say how close do you pull up because there's a good little gap being get left by forzan El Nabi. at what point do you decide to push and burn a good start on this one loxton now i think has to go midway through this chicane and not wait for Phil Cell. If Phil Cell halts, you back off of it and pull alongside. You're allowed to do that and then go again. So Brett Loxton's got to be clever on the way that he has this restart. Phil Cell has led pretty much every green flag lap that's not been in the pit stop. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Goes off the exit. A little bit better this time from Phil Cell. It's Madison down who struggles as we go green. Forzano Narby in all shades of trouble because here's Maloney trying to get himself back into play. Down the inside that he will look. Looking for a top five against the trick and almost contact oh. between them and they're bang into the background goes Cooper Webster finding an alleyway down the inside but the alleyway's a dead end and he falls back yeah absolutely now this is going to be the crunch point at every restart it's this section of the track where things seem to go off Bill and Loxton still pretty even at the moment but there's a poor exit from Blake Purdy he is now under big pressure from Ethan Griggolt coming into this chicane Griggolt sees the gap opens and he goes for it but will Purdy be able to hold it around the outside he will That's it. Ethan Griggolt losing a bit of ground and now Jake Burton yes Sperry oh my goodness he Ian Ford, Ian Ford. Down the inside of Loxton, and he steals it up into second position. Loxton was not expecting that, and Phil sells away. Mistake. Slow down for Brett Loxton. Oh, no. That 
that's going to be all that. There's three positions, four positions, five positions that go, six positions that potentially go as well. On the brakes into the right-hander, almost contact there as the one performance car tries to find a way through and does so in the end. That there is Wayne Burke, still battling it out too wide. Behind that, though, Blake Birdie still going out to Jake Burton as they make their way down the long back stretch. And he's going to back out of it just for the moment, but Phil Sell's clear. Back out from Burke as Loxton gets himself through, but it is Phil Sell followed by Ford. It's ERT 1-2 at the front. Yeah, and that could not be more perfect for them. That's fantastic stuff from ERT. Unfortunate for Brett Loxton, who is now facing a huge amount of pressure to try and stay in that top 10, but we do take a, a brief look at, uh, at Dane Warren as he tries to make good on this result. Try and do everything that he possibly can as Dane Warren takes a wide line. He dropped to Carl Stokes, James McKee, Michael Healy as well. Three positions gone. And his torrid day is Ethan Greg Galt has a big wiggle, and I think he's actually smacked the wall coming oh through. Oh no! To big big crash three. behind them! Big crash! Jake Burton and Blake Purdy have come together. Oh, and Purdy has done so well to keep that one away from the rest of the vehicle. There was Burton coming through. Burton clipped the wall on the inside. Bang! Both of them into the Arco. So lucky that no one else uh, gets through. And Purdy is desperately trying to bring his vehicle home. We stay green here at Montreal. And oh, indeed, I believe we've just heard Jay Kennedy feel just how that one works. And Burton's positiveness is probably gone. Here's Cracknell, though. So I think to go down the inside of Rhino Sullivan. And he's not quite having any of it at the moment. Look at Madison down as well. He's trying to attack him. Ford. Yeah, certainly is. So Ian Ford now having made his way into second as uh, Jake Burton uh, having a little bit of trouble in a straight line. But uh, Ian Ford, he's uh, performing a good duty here to try and keep those guys behind Jared Philsell. But he needs to think about his own race as well. He's been fuel saving almost from the get go. And he's actually managed to gap down a little bit down that straight. So Ford with some good pace here, but that train of cars behind him is ready to pounce at any time. The question becomes, Phil Cell cannot fuel save. At the front, he will have to play lift and coast, and when it comes to crunch time, can he make it to the end, even with the copious amounts of fuel saving that he's had left? He might be have to be called Jared Fuel Save if he makes his way over to the line and wins this one. But look at this pack right now. Off of the back of it was Ethan Grigg Galt. He had a slowdown at the final corner. So now Wayne Burke's got to get aggressive. As does Brett Loxton here because he's got the young Cooper Webster to get by. Maloney, who's done very well to get in this. El Nabi, who finds himself in fourth position and arguably driver of the day candidate at the moment on lap 39. This has become important, but Madison oh, down. down goes too far. And now he's going to have to take the slow because El Nabi's on the podium. Yeah, definitely seems that way. Now it's up to Down to try and preserve as many positions as he can while clearing this slowdown. He's going to have a go at it, but Webster on the inside of him there, as is Loxton. So now Brett Loxton is the one that Madison Down will be facing pressure from. Oh, trouble, Soslowski. He's off in the middle of the bangle, and he had it off right before contact with the uh, OPR car of Dean O'Brien, who sends him for a ride, and lucky nobody else really got involved. Anderson just got around it. Everyone else did too, but that was a scary one. That was a mirror of what happened earlier with Nick Cummings and Joshua Anderson. As we have a replay on screen, you're going to have a look at what happened here. So, Soslowski got on the brakes, and Burke was uh, just... Um, barreling into him there. Uh, I think Sislowski got on the brakes a bit early that time. I do not mind. My apologies. I keep, I keep getting those cars confused. My apologies. Well, that's no worries at all for the moment, but Dean O'Brien getting a big hit, and that wasn't what the doctor ordered. Here's Cooper Webster, though. He's trying to attack Jake Maloney for a top five finish. Or well, sorry, for fourth position right now out on circuit, because you, know, you ask where Madison Down is, Down has really dropped off the pace. He's behind Wayne Burke and by a fair margin as well. I think he's had a second slowdown to deal with, too, and that is not what Trans Tansman wanted from being top of the world just one year ago. In fact, at the final race, they were top of the world. Right now, for the first time I think I've ever heard, there is no Trans-Tasman car inside the top seven in this field. Wow. That that really tells you something about the way this race has gone. That's uh, quite tragic, I think, for Trans-Tasman. 
Madison, though, he's got a good head on his shoulders. He is a former champion of this series. I feel that he can do something in the midst of all of this. Jake Burton, meanwhile, has retired from the race. Obviously, the damage sustained was too much from that incident, so he is now out as well. Battle for 15th is on. Kyle Stokes, James McKee, in fact, for 14th with Dane Warren in tow as well. Defensive line taken by Kyle Stokes, and he just about covers the lane as he gets on the brakes into the right-left chicane. And ultimately, Warren is sitting back and hoping, well, come on, guys, I need to get moving here. I'm supposed to be a top-10 driver. But you don't get that sort of respect here when it comes to V8 stops. You fight for every position that you have available for you. There's Warren down the inside of McKee, and the CMR car ultimately loses out nicely done there from Warren it's uh, it's unfortunate that he's so far down in this one but unfortunately I think uh, the uh, the slowdowns were uh, really putting a dent into his campaign here at Montreal Kyle Stokes as well seems to have quite a bit of pace at the moment Warren I'm noticing is struggling to catch up to him a bit meanwhile there's news yeah. up the front because Ford El Nabi and Maloney are catching our leader Phil Cell. I reckon Phil Cell's wanting to back up into this pack and save fuel. I don't think he's uh, comfortable of getting home on his own. He needs Ian Ford's help, but look at this. Faster than both of them was Forzan on that last lap. Yeah. Forzan, get this, eight tenths quicker that last time by, and Phil Cell is pretty much within a second. He needs help. He needs drafting buddies, and the biggest drafting buddy is in second, holding off the entirety of the world behind him. Yeah, exactly right. And Brett Loxton was the fastest car on track last lap gap for the lead now under a second. You saw the lap times there up on the screen just a few moments ago. Phil Sauer 36.6, Ian Ford a 36.2, Fozen El Nabi a 35.8. So these guys have really turned it on after this last caution period. Let's have a look at the lap times now. Jared Phil Sell, another 36.6 from Ian Ford. We've got a 36-0 and a 36-0 again from El Nabi. Goodness me, this is heating up. Brett Loxton was eight tenths quicker that last time by on a 35-8. Wayne Burke had a slow down penalty and has dropped behind Madison Down who moves up into seventh position. All of a sudden, this race and this race having 18 laps to go when they next cross the line is sudden, uh, sorry, 16 laps to go when they next cross the line is really starting to heat up in a way that many has not expected here. Jared Philsell holds the lead, but he's had a couple of poor laps trying to get back the draft, trying to get back some fuel saving here. And all of a sudden, if you feel like you're safe in the middle of that pack, you go out there and attack. Someone like Maloney, even Forzan's got nothing to lose here. Forzan should be the one right on Ian Ford here, trying to get aggressive. Yeah, that's exactly it. And, you know, at this stage of the race, it's all up in the air. You still don't know if there will be some drivers in this field who still need to come in to take an extra pit stop. It, it's really, absolutely anything goes at this stage. Everything goes at this stage. Not anything, everything at this one. But right now, it's just a case of everyone just trying to find their own little place as Kurt Stenberg tries to find a way around Josh Anderson. This one uh, is for 18th position. Stenberg has lost the position on this lap, but he will not find anything more further in terms of his little battle to continue on that push. But, crucially, keep an eye on that gap. It was eight tenths of a second. It's now increased a little bit. Phil Sells maybe found a bit of pace, 35-7 that last time by. So now it's just a case of it closes down, it speeds back up again, and we're now starting to see maybe uh, Phil Sells trying to keep the pack at about a second away. Yeah, it definitely seems that way. We are looking at the moment uh, at Simon Feigl, who's found himself involved in a very tight battle between uh, James Scott and John Emerson. These guys heading up their own little train from 22nd back. Uh, O'Brien and Kelly just behind them as well. Yes, and they're all having this beautiful scrap, which completely runs all the way, in theory, to Josh Muggleton, who's trying to stay with Stenberg. So this pack towards the rear really hasn't splinted as such but we have seen drivers dropping back like Sir Corey Preston's back in 27th position after at one stage being up inside the top 15 that's been the differences that we have seen over the course of these laps and how everyone is now starting to try and push try and find an extra gap an extra little inch in 
every little battle that they've got to push forward. Ryan O'Sullivan, for example, he's battling Cracknell for 11th position out on track, and that's a great uh, bit of job. But Chris Cox here, let's not forget, he stopped, what, five times in this race already? He's in the top 10. Goodness me. <laughs> Cannot believe that, man. Chris Cox said the absolute run that this guy has had from the start just goes to show that if you play your strategy cards Ooh. right, it doesn't matter how many times you take a tour into the pit lane, you're still in contention for something. Madison has very nearly hit the wall of champions, if not clipped it, and that has brought Wayne Burke back into this fight for what is going to be 8th and 7th and 8th position there. He was mightily close to being hitting basically the Madison down wall of champions, but right there, Wayne Burke still not quite able to attack. Yeah, certainly not. Madison uh, has had a little bit of an issue here since going down the field slightly, getting a replay of that. Oh, just a bit of a clip. Just a bit of a clip of the tyres, but apart from that, it seems like the car is fine. He's actually starting to gap Burke slightly. Ever so slightly, and he does need to try and get on to that brett loxton train which seemingly has left the station just for a moment 50, uh, 35 nines being done at the moment here in this field and they all now start attacking and trying to make things work as i've just seen i think both um o'sullivan and cracknell have slowed down penalties and uh oh they're get together almost contact there at that stage michael healy encroached on them and all of a sudden it all hots up it certainly does. These guys starting to fall back into the clutches of Warren, McMullen, McKee, and the train behind them. So this is uh, certainly a little awkward coming into the dying stages of this race. You can see the run that Cracknell had on O'Sullivan there. And uh, now these guys facing quite a bit of extra pressure from Mr. Healy. And all that pressure is not going to be helpful one bit. Everyone's got to try and run the pace that they know that they can. And they know that if any one driver finds himself at the front of the pack, that's probably the worst place. Anderson down the inside of McKee and does get the position on the CMR car and gets that one working. Just behind that, Stenberg and Stokes are still there as Mogleton desperately tries to get onto that pack. This mid-pack important points on offering here for those that try and get well a few retirees so far today richard hampstead ethan warren nicole foggy luke harvey sam blacklock nick cummings and johnny brandon the big ones uh, also along with that is blake purdy and jake burton who are both out of this race yeah quite a few names there that uh, that are quite disappointing to see on the retirements list as we take a look at uh, kelly and o'brien behind james scott here very tight quarters in that section of the circuit and with those cars that close to you kelly though looks like he's really desiring a move here i think he is and i think kelly has got to think about how he decides where and when he wants to be that aggressor and to attack to make that move so Right now, James Scott, well, he's going to be looking at this one. Kelly's going to die for it down the inside. Let's off the brakes late, and that is well played from the Grand Tasman man and Sean Kelly. Uh, that, you could say, could have been out of the playbook of Rick Kelly. Yeah, certainly. Kelly, he's been, uh, he's been around this community for quite some time. Goodness me, close quarters down the back stretch. I feel that Scott isn't quite done with him here, but, he, but Sean Kelly, he's been around here for years, and he's a very capable driver. Doesn't get many chances to show it these days, but that's certainly one of those chances. Meanwhile, up the front, I, uh, I do want to draw your attention to something. Jared Philsell is starting to gap the front again. Yeah, 35-9 that last time by compared to a 36-1 of Ian Ford, 36-2 of Forza and El Narby. He himself a second back. They are starting to splinter here just enough. I think Phil Cell feels like he's running a pace that he's comfortable at, which again, nobody else has seemingly matched him over mid-race pace. That's where Phil Cell has just destroyed everybody in this field today here, Reese. It's the fact that his, first, his opening pace is good. He can be matched on that. It's the mid and late race pace where nobody can get close. As here comes Brett Loxton having a half look down the inside of Cooper Webster and still nothing. 
Yeah, definitely. Loxton's starting to have troubles here. Um, issues getting by people, and it's getting by people that he needs at the moment. Remember, he qualified on the front row and was in contention for the win in the opening stages. If he can turn this around somehow, that would be a really awesome result for him. But you are right about Phil Cell. His mid and late race pace is just oodles better than everyone else in this field. Oh, and what the question the is, wall? I'm not too sure, but we'll have a look yes. back at it. See, he has, and I think he has clipped that wall of champions. So, for Maloney, heads Ooh. through the right, heads through the left. That was close. It was close, yes, you're absolutely right. I think he's just had a tickle with it at the moment. Nothing too um, really hurtful as bang, late in goes a certain Cooper Webster and he struggles off the exit which allows Loxton a chance maybe to attack this one into turn six. Can he get down the inside? Oh, he's going to be a brave man to try it there but room being given between the pair and that will allow Maloney to run away. Yeah, certainly will. That's not optimal for either of them. Maloney being his usual smooth self and uh, Webster and Loxton kind of tripping over each other at this stage, I think. Loxton, you can tell, he's trying to size up Webster. He's trying to set up a move, but he's not being afforded many chances to do that. There could be one here at the hairpin. They're almost bumper to bumper. It was a good exit from that last chicane by Loxton, and he's going to go for that dive up the inside. But remember, you can hold the outside around here. Actually, hold up a minute. A little bit of slight drifting. <laughs> a little bit of a bump on the exit. I think, I, I think that's how you do an overtake right there. My goodness. Uh, is, is that pass of the season so far? I think it is, but you've got to make it stick here, Brett. Here comes Cooper Webster back, but he yields away from it. So Loxton gets the position at the cost of a couple of seconds to Jake Maloney, and I think that's the big kicker over this one. Gap at the front now starting to extend out a little bit here. It is 1.4 seconds at the front, but Forzan took two out of the two in front. So there is still clear fuel saving because Forzan still got that great pace to go out there and be that aggressor. Now look at who's on the back of the train involving Ethan Greg Gold to Madison down. Coxhead is up into ninth because Wayne Burke is now dropping backwards through this field into 10th. And right now you have to say, Ethan Greg Gold to Madison down are probably not expecting KRF to be this strong here today. They have been absolutely sensational. How good has Coxhead's pace been in, in this late race? It's been absolutely immense. It's great to see him uh, up this far. Of course, we usually don't get a, an opportunity to talk about Chris Coxhead outside of the Enduros when uh, when he tends to get up there. But uh, his his he actually has a Bathurst podium, does Chris Coxhead. So Enduros is where we usually see him come to the fore. But here in Montreal, it's been a great run for him. It has been sensational, of course, there's a former enduro track last year here at Montreal, so he does understand that how important this track has been and how good he has run. So for the time being, at least, it's going to have to be a very difficult challenge for him to get past two of probably the title protagonists last year in Ethan Greg Galt and Madison Down. Not in a position yet to get anywhere near, and he's got to hold off a very hungry Wayne Burke too wants to get himself over to the end we are now 10 laps away from the end of racing here at circuit shield Villeneuve. jared phil cell 1.6 clear at the front of the pack right now which is still got ian ford 1.2 ahead of forzan el nabi who is himself a further two seconds ahead of jake maloney neither of them able to encroach in on anyone else almost like magnets at the moment is dane warren though in this battle for 11th place he's trying to get past super split two winner rhino sullivan trying to look down the inside no room has to wait yes indeed and if if warren's capable of anything we know it's making overtakes he's a very quick driver he is but it just has not been his day today in his first proper outing as a v8 supercar driver for altus esports He's trying to get some kind of run through the sweeper, maybe maybe fling one up the inside at uh, one of the chicanes would definitely help him, but that little bit of oversteer on the exit is not going to help him. No, not at all, and he's just lost that 
run into the third chicane. That little left-right wiggle was not what was good. Coxhead, though, keep an eye on this. He's just trying everything. He's lost the position, actually, to Wayne Burke, and that was all done for a slow-down penalty. Went way too deep in the corner and has just dropped back and lost out. Look at Ethan Grigg Golt, though. He's looking to try and push to get to Madison down, and Cooper Webster just in front, and for the moment, Ethan Grigg Golt feels he's got a great chance here of trying to make a move, but no, still unable to make anything happen at the moment, as the front eight have really just packed themselves out together at this stage. Still, not much left to go, and it's 1.8 now for Phil Sell, who is just building enough of a gap at the front to just hold a buffer if the fuel runs out come that final chicane. Yep, O'Sullivan and Warren swap positions into the chicane and now they swap positions out of it. It's another slowdown for Dane Warren. He's going incredibly slowly down the front stretch. He's had to he's had to go all the way back there to 13th position. What a shame for him. It shows you how much luck Dane Warren has at the moment when you're in 13th. Mm. That much has to be said. And but someone who has been quiet through this, Marlon McMullen for CMRT. They have managed, well, he's managed to pull himself up into 14th. He is the biggest mover in the field at the moment at an astonishing 16 places. Yeah, certainly an excellent job from McMullen. And uh, actually, I don't know if I was hearing audio from McMullen or Warren, but I heard one of them clutching. So there's still a lot of fuel saving going on, even under these green flag conditions. Well, they all know that and they're hoping to have some draft and those in the front five have none at the moment that much is very very clear talk about those who actually have damage on their vehicles Ethan Grigg, Gold and Wayne Burke certainly do along with Chris Coxhead they're all going to be struggling with fuel numbers as well because you have to remember if they've not got as much top speed they're using more fuel to get to the same speed yeah that's exactly right and that's why the draft is so important down here as uh, we take a look at michael cracknell and ryan o'sullivan my goodness so close down down this stretch towards the chicane and i get the feeling that o'sullivan is just letting off a bit early and yielding to people now i think he might start to be driving to a number he's starting to lose positions oh yeah, have a look at warren, warren. Here. Look at this, to the outside, he will try and go, and O'Sullivan lifts out of it, he's not battling anymore. He's either lifting for fuel, or he's lifting because of the incident limit number, both of which just as important as the other at this stage, as I believe there is a slowdown as well coming into players uh, at this stage. So drivers McKee. are starting to struggle, it's James McKee who ended up having to slow that right down, and look at how far he's dropped, he's behind Carl Stokes now, of all people, such was the way that he was struggling coming off of it but still it is Phil Sell's race to lose at the front of this one but he's at the team which are the best fuel savers in the business evolution racing team yes indeed and I think they'd uh, they'd be equal on par with trick sim sports as well when it comes to fuel saving they're the two teams that we usually uh, have pop into our minds when it comes to strategy that's Dane Warren getting by uh, Michael Cracknell there and uh, that seemed like a fairly easy move done it was a fairly easy move done, and he's done well. Ethan Grigolt again trying to find a way past Madison down, and the pair of them seemingly cannot leave each other alone in races, and Madison again is seemingly the iron wall defense compared to the rock-solid attack of Ethan Grigolt, who has recovered after what was a spin just before the pit stop window, uh, before the first safety car, to get back into a great position of attack in these latter stages of this event. And Jared Filson does another 36-1, takes another four tenths out of his teammate Ford. This one's still not over for the podium. Forzan is still only 1.3 back and could find a charge late, but there's only seven laps left to go. And if you are gonna start making moves, you've got to find time now. Yeah, you certainly do. And one driver that hasn't found time in the last lap is Jake Maloney. He actually did a 37 on that last lap, so might have to keep an eye out for him remember he took that really early pit stop and it was completely out of strategy in the early sections of the race we don't know how much fuel he has left in that car at the moment so maybe we might see those times continue to increase well the thing that he did though is that he came down on that final caution that we just saw so 
That's yeah. where Cooper Webster, uh, sorry, that's where Jake Maloney um, has equalized himself now on strategy with everyone else. His strategy worked. He got a caution at exactly the right time, right before the final strategy stop, and he's got himself oh. perfectly in position as Ethan Craig goal doors Madison down by. And right there was a case of, yeah, I'm, I'm tired now of trying to get going through. A little bit of a slide, bang, hard into the door. And Madison's not going to take that sitting down. Huge look to the inside as he gets through at the very earliest opportunity. I think Ethan Greg Galt just knows that, okay, I've tactically made a mistake here, but can he get the run to one? Yeah, good question there. As uh, they continue on that run to one, it seems that Madison has got the run on Ethan Griggolt there. And I think Ethan might have to wait until the next time they come to that chicane. Maybe keep all four tyres gripped up this time. Yeah, and that's all four tyres gripped that he needs. And he has been thoroughly frustrated over this final stint by Madison Down, who has been more enough an equal over this stint so some great racing that we've been seeing from everyone trying to make that push but for the moment at least it seems that ian ford is the big liability because forzan is looking to find himself maybe second position that gap was 1.2 that last time by and he's been just chipping a tenth away at a time if he gets draft that's going to be even worse right now for ford yeah it absolutely is um forzan was uh about a tenth faster on that last lap and of course Ian Ford with that slight damage to the front that's going to increase the drag of his car a little make him use a bit more fuel in a straight line that's exactly what El Nabi wants he himself is carrying a bit of damage but not to the same extent that Ford is and you can see that run down the straight leading up to the final turn you can see El Nabi looming in the background. He knows what he wants as there is five laps to go. There is when Phil Cell crosses the start finish line and Ian Ford is effectively that rear gunner to Forzan El Nabi. And for the moment, Phil Cell, 36-2. He's just running times that are better than everybody else at the moment. Another three tenths locked off. But Forzan takes three of his own off of Ian Ford and brings that under a second for the first time. Battle for fourth as well as Loxton tries to get back at Maloney. He lost himself comparatively four tenths of a second on that last lap. Maloney is struggling. Ford is struggling. And now it's a case of how you try a battle as Coxhead and Burke battle it out as well. Yeah, and meanwhile, that was a very, this is a very interesting fight going on between James Scott. Oh my goodness, he's off into the grass. Oh, Scott forced to take to the runoff area there. That is a real shame. That was very awkward. Griffin Gardner trying to make his way through and Corey Preston and uh, Emily Jones were just there, front seats. Yeah, they were just bystanders watching as they now continue to have their own little scrap out on circuit for the minor positions in this one around 24, 25th and 26th in this one. But still, we start worrying here, wondering, are fuel numbers okay? Can we still push? Can we still attack? Brett Loxton is probably best poised out of anyone. Gets a good run off of the exit there and he's got himself probably the best shot he's had yet of trying to get past Maloney. He can just stay within a tent. Yeah, just a tenth is what he needs. He's a bit far back to make a proper move into the chicane at the moment, but he's got that draft. He'll be able to save a little bit more fuel, gain a little bit more in the braking zone. That is priority number one for Brett Loxton. And oh my goodness, so close to the wall of champions, oversteering as well. If that doesn't tell you how hard Brett Loxton is pushing right now, I don't know what does. Well, I'm not sure, and look at this now with just four laps to go. Surely Loxton looking at four, thinking, OK, now surely my time. Remember, there's still Ethan Grigg goal stuck, and now also stuck Chris Coxhead looking for ninth position out of all of this. So here's Brett Loxton trying everything through three and four. Nice little line there by Maloney, able to just pull apart a bit of gap in this outfield section and on the brakes in towards seven huge lockup from the ttl vehicle of course new sponsorship on that one as well but still krf hoping that it's all going to stand very nicely with loxton yeah for sure we take a look at uh, brett loxton from the back of jake maloney 
big rear wing of that TTL Esports Falcon blocking him slightly, but you know how close they are. And Loxton pushing as well. Again, a bit of oversteer over that exit curb. Will it be a run into the hairpin? No. Loxton continuing to stay behind, but he's he's really ranging up there on Maloney on entry. Maloney beating him slightly on exit. That's not what he wants. No, he's got nothing on acceleration right now, and that's where TTL have really dominated this one with Maloney in fourth position. There's not much that Loxton can do here to really showcase that he's got the ability to overtake. It's only adding confidence here to Maloney as they head through the final chicane with three laps remaining. It's now Phil Sell's lead up at three seconds now at the front of the field. He's dominating and pulling away at a rate which nobody else seemingly is capable of doing. Little half looking to turn number one from Loxton. Still nothing quite there as now everyone starts thinking about where's the next battle coming. Cracknell is under all sorts of pressure here from Dave Warren in this battle for 11th and look at Dane start to think about where do I push, where do I attack? Not this time, not just yet. Yeah, Cracknell uh, going for that B line to the apex of turn one. A uh, little bit of defensive driving there and you can, you can see the frustration in Warren's driving. He has a clean car. He's been one of the faster guys out on track today, but he has just not had it fall his way when it comes to track limits violations. So uh, it's, it's really unfortunate for him, but you can see Michael Cracknell is facing up to that pressure very well. Madison Down and Ethan Grigg Gold, though, just briefly on screen there, they are incredibly close too. They are, and this is where Ethan Grigg Gold's done well. Is it a defensive line being taken? Slightly later on the brakes and getting oh, in. Look out for Dane Warren. Down's done well. Look at Dane Warren as well, because he's got a very good run. Uh, a very bad run, Sperry. Incredibly bad, bad run. run. Look at how far back he is. I know. Look at this. Here's Marlon McMullen trying to go down the inside. Uber defense. And that one will continue as they go up through the motions. But it's look at this. There. Here is Madison. Too wide and trying to make the move. Down and getting it there. Yes. As Ethan Grigol can go through. And yikes indeed. Excellent move from Ethan Grigol. That was fantastic to watch. Now McMullen with the big run on Warren. What's going to happen here? Warren going defensive on the inside. A little bit of a touch. And McMullen's going around. No, he's not. He's been able to keep it going. Great save. At the cost of what, though? He's got damage. Oh, no. He's got big damage. And look at that. There's O'Sullivan finding a way through. Anderson as well will look to try and go by. But now McMullen has got nothing left through turn one and is struggling with everything that he's got to try and get himself over to the line. We look further forward, though, with the penultimate lap going. And for the time being, at least, Loxton has been stuck with Maloney. And it's just seemingly like the life is fading out of these attacks. Yeah, certainly. Brett Loxton, I mean, you, you, you cannot fault the guy, I don't think. He's done incredibly well in this one, regardless of where he eventually finishes. But you can see he's starting to get spent. His car's spent, his tire's spent. He's probably mentally spent as well, the Perth boy. And he's not having a good time behind Jake Maloney right now, especially with Cooper Webster still there behind him, ready to pounce if he makes one error. Well, it's only one error that you need, and the white flag will come out for the number one, Jared Philsell, at the front of this field. But look at the run that Loxton's got. He's thinking Ooh. about making the move, but he's thought better of it. He will have to do it on the final lap if he's got any chances to go and make this one happen. No, he cannot try and make this one into turn number one, I don't think. Rick Galt, though, has finally dispatched of Madison down by a fair margin and a half. So he'll be very happy at the way he's got through all of that. And he is gone with the win. But how much has that cost him over the final stages of this event? Brett Loxton still, though, looking. And he needs a good opening section of this lap because he's had nothing to work with so far and nothing he still has. And we still wonder, is everybody safe? to get to the end on fuel. Nobody has spluttered and coughed over the line. And in fact, Phil Sells just did a 36 flat on that last oh. time by to prove just how good that he can potentially be. Maloney actually finding a bit of pace now when he needs it the most. Ian Ford in seconds had nothing for his teammate here today. You've got Forzan El Nabi who's run the gauntlet effectively, fantastically with strategy to get himself 
up into position. But now Loxton, this is probably the final chances you're going to get. If you can't do it at La Pangle, you've got to do it at the final chicane. And Loxton's 209 against the 29 at the moment is finding nothing at the moment on the brakes into the right hand hairpin. And now it's about picking up a run and it's okay for the moment, just okay. But to Jared Philsell, a corner remains in terms of what he needs to do. He's lifting mighty, mighty early for this final chicane. And at the moment, I'm wondering, has he run himself out right towards the line? He's gonna slow it all the way down as Ian Ford tries to chase it. He's, he's out, outfield. is he out? Oh no, he's not. He's just oh. made himself over the line and takes victory to boot as well. And Brett Loxton couldn't get past Jake Maloney. Phil Sell worrying and slowing it down, but it's not about how much you win a race by. It's the fact that you win a race itself. But there's some fantastic battling also going all the way to the end of this event. Any two wides is going to happen. McKee having to defend from Kyle Stokes. Stokes unable to get anywhere on the brakes. Yeah, certainly. It looks like these guys are going to finish the way they are as it stands. Awesome job from those guys to get home uh, reasonably cleanly. Oh my goodness! Steny just running out of fuel across the line and the CMR car just took it. That is called thievery by 51 hundredths of a second. James McKee will uh, call those a freebie and that much very much an easy freebie to finish this event. The event all over, official classified results and they are up on your screen right now. Jared Philsell picks up the victory and he does struggle his way over to the line and he is donutting his way forward to continue on his action. So I don't think he was out of fuel by any stretch of the imagination, just slowing it down at the end to celebrate with his teammate Ian Ford in second position. Forzan El Nabi will come home with a podium in third with Jake Maloney in fourth position. Brett Loxton finishes off in fifth with Cooper Webster sixth and it's Ethan Greg Gold seventh with Madison down dispatched with an eighth. Wayne Burke finishing ninth in the end. Chris Cox said with those five pit stops up in 10th position. Fantastic run from him. Michael Cracknell makes it Zuba Racing and KRF 10th and 11th. Z uh, Dane Warren, big loser out of this one. If it weren't for those slowdowns, he would have been up much further. Ryan O'Sullivan in 13th, a great night for him winning split two and coming home in that position. 14th Anderson, Healy and McMullen rounding out the top 16. And then from there, a little bit further down, Josh Moulton gets 17th and 18th goes to James McKee, stealing one from Stenberg on the line. Kyle Stokes gets 19th position, but plus 19 is the man uh, in 21st position, which is John Emerson. So Kyle Stokes getting 20th position. Simon Feigl, team boss at Altus. It's 22nd on a day, which is rather forgettable, I think has to be said for Altus drivers. Dino Bryan gets 23rd with Sean Kelly in 24th. It was a good qualifying session for Corey Preston, but unfortunately events in the race put paid to that. He's going to have to settle for 25th. Emily Jones loses one position, finishing 26th. Griffin Gardner making up 10 with Michael Taliansic up even further, starting in dead last and coming in within the top 30 and rounding out our field, our finishes anyway. We have uh, Jack Boyd, James Scott, Brett Kananzi and Scott Soslowski. Yes, we do. And then those who retired from this one, Jake Burton and Blake Purdy, together they came just after the restart. Johnny Brandon, the cause of the final caution. Nick Cummings and Sam Blacklock not having good races. Luke Harvey suffering with technical issues all day long. Nicole Foggy and Ethan Warren getting themselves caught up with the caution that was caused by Richard Hampstead. Yes, well, indeed. with racing. Yes, indeed, indeed. But with racing action all over and done with, we're going to step aside here on the iRacing Esports Network because the post-race show is coming to you after this. Driver interviews, etc., etc. And we will see you in just a few moments' time. What racing we've seen at the moment from Montreal.
fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got traction, he's got rhythm, he's got both of them. Maloney! Oh, oh he's taking Anderson. Anderson's up to him. Oh, my God! Oh, a big crash. Oh, my goodness, half the field's going to get involved. This is very close. These guys are one I want to make their way through the field very quickly. This is it! This is over! I can't believe this! Oh my god! God, what?! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Virtual Racing School V8 Supercars Online Premier Series. The number one V8 Supercar League in all of sim racing. And my goodness me, were we in for a treat of racing action here today. Although this has been declared as arguably the most difficult season of V8 Scops to date, the one which is going to be the most different that we've seen, some habits always stay the same. Jared Philsell joins us in the commentary booth. It's a different team, but it is victory for Evolution Racing Team. Jared, has to be said, the gap didn't really matter. A form finish to finish. Yeah, um, I think I pulled out a bit of a gap earlier on in the race. Um, and then... Yeah, I think I dropped back to help my teammate out a bit with some fuel there and then just took off a bit and then let back, let him come back for a nice photo for the Well, a nice photo for the boys. But let's talk us through um, what was a very difficult openings um, part of the race because you had Brett Loxton for at least the first two laps or so, really aggressive, really attacking you, looking to try and make a move very early. But once the first caution came out, it was a completely different story. You were able to run away and really work on the vehicle. Just how good was the mid to late race pace of your car? Yeah, it was quite good, to be honest. Um, obviously, with the server settings, we were expecting some afternoon weather. So we were obviously tuning for that. So uh, with the mistake from the OSR boys, unfortunately, um, it kind of threw a bit of a spanner in the works, to be honest. The um, car didn't really feel that great in the colder weather. Um, but once we started getting around uh, mid to high 20s, um, yeah, that, that's where the set really came alive and just seemed like our tyres just held on. I'm not sure about the other ERT guys. I'm pretty sure they had pretty good tyre life as well. And, of course, Interlagos coming up next in the championship, so to a very, very hot circuit next. So in terms of how you prepare after what was, I'd say, probably a mild race that we had here today at uh, Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, how will Interlagos play in terms of a difference compared to um, the circuit that we've had here at Gilles Villeneuve? Yeah, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I think it's a reverse um, grid uh, race again, so that'll be that'll be interesting again. But um, I'm sure we'll sure we'll do fine. It's um, usually a pretty good track for me, so I will knuckle down um, and get onto it. The opportunity to knuckle down and really work hard. But for those who get it done for you, shout outs and sponsors. Yeah, just let me grab my list. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks to Logitech G, obviously. Uh, Speed Cafe, Joel Real Timing, and obviously Jamie from West End Mazda. Um, great sponsors for the team, so can't thank those boys. Well, no worries at all. Jared Philsell comes home with the race victory. Reese Gardner standing by with second positions, Evolution Racing Team uh, driver, and that is Ian Ford. Absolutely, Ian. A 1-2 on debut for Jared Philsell and the team, uh, and yourself there uh, in second place. A fantastic result for you guys at Evolution Racing Team, kicking off another era. Yeah, absolutely. It's like Jared goes all right for a... For a youngster, so <laughs> what is he like about mid fifties? Uh, no, it's a... <laughs> Jeez. no so, it's, a, it's a fantastic drive for everyone tonight. Um, Ethan driving back through the field, it's like he pitted right as that last safety car came out, so he actually had fuel save ev more than everyone else. So for him to come through the field to finish where he did is a good um good start. This will probably most like most likely be his drop round, and yeah, it's like I I just put my head down and literally stayed out of trouble. Did a few. Did a few bonsai moves to make sure that I could pick up a spot every now and then when I had to keep on going, especially with Madison and Forzan behind me. And, you know, this is a unbelievable start to the season. That's definitely a PB for me. Yeah, absolutely. So I suppose your your approach to the strategy, you just said it yourself, stay out of trouble. But um, how, how did the manual safety car affect things from your perspective? 
Uh, it was not really any different compared to normal. Uh, there was that mess up at the start where we didn't actually get the safety car call until the safety car was on track. So that was probably the only risky thing, especially with everyone moving around like at race pace. Um, yeah, other than that, there was no real strategy variations like that I can really call. There was no defining moments. I literally just kept my head down, made sure I didn't get any slowdowns, which I kept at a zero. And, you know, I just had to hustle when I had to hustle. You've been one of the longest serving drivers at Evolution Racing Team, so you've seen quite a bit in uh, in your time in uh, the iRacing V8 supercar. Uh, and it definitely seems, especially coming into this season, that you guys have hit a very good stride. So uh, the future is looking bright for you. Oh, for sure it is. It's like this season's going to hopefully be a standout. Hopefully we keep up these sort of results uh, with Jared and Ethan leading the charge and I'll I'll be doing as um, many rounds as I can this year. I'm not sure if I can lock in a full schedule, but I'll be definitely like running the full endurance season. Uh, it's, it's just going to be one of those things. It's like I've had to step up my game to make sure that I'm not lagging behind and doing an embarrassing job, but, uh, you know, only a couple of tenths off these guys. But uh, this definitely, definitely shows that I'm heading in the right direction. And, you know, we've definitely got a lot to learn still about the car, especially as the tracks heat, heats up in the, um, from morning to afternoon. Indeed. Well, hopefully we will see you at Interlagos again, Ian Ford. An awesome opening round for you, Jake. You are standing by with Mr. El Nabi. I am Forza El Nabi for Trick Sim Sports. A massive, massive podium, uh, especially after the place where he started. Forza, from 12th up to 3rd, a massive, massive result for you. But more importantly was the decision to come in and short fuel on that opening stop giving you the opportunity to break ahead against everyone else. And then when the second caution comes out, primed in position to take the stop. Um, hey, Jake. Yeah, um, I wasn't actually, I didn't actually um, short fill that uh, first pit stop. I was actually um, fuel saving a lot that first stint. So, yeah, I think it was just um, the fact of having a um, shorter stop, um, that first pit stop is what put me out in, in good clean air. And, yeah, I was able to do... Um, Decent laps, I guess, um, throughout the race. And, yeah, I just um, clawed my way back back that way. And, yeah, to finish P3 from where I started, I guess, first round up, um, not, really a, not really a bad result, you can say. And, yeah, um, overall, I'm pretty happy. But, yeah, I think there's, there's a few stuff that, that went wrong in terms of um, server issues and um, what happened with the time of the day, et cetera. So, yeah, I, th I thought that was... Um, yeah, it was a bit off-putting at the start, and yeah, it wasn't wasn't really ideal. So yeah, I had to had to adapt on the fly, obviously, and yeah, to come out P three. Um, yeah, pretty happy. And in terms of uh, adaption, you were right up there. You managed to get yourself that big result. But let's go all the way back to pre-qualification because we haven't really talked too much about it. Is this field this year the closest, the tightest, the most competitive it ever has been? Oh, definitely. I think I think so. I think it is. Um, so with the times, obviously. Um, for me personally, I didn't really um do many laps in in pre qualification. I just um went through my um normal race routine and went prep that way. And yeah, I um didn't really um take pre quali as I should, I guess you could say. And yeah, I was um pretty confident um race pace wise, obviously. But yeah, um as you said, it's definitely um. One of the best fields we've we've ever got, and yeah, everyone um, everyone's doing a really good job and putting a putting a great series together. And in terms of where you're heading to next, it's got a very special ring to you in V8 Scops, of course. Uh, one of the places that you picked up your first victory, and of course that is into Lagos. So, in terms of how that's going to influence the way that you're racing, how are you going to take what you learned last year at Inter Lagos with that victory? and then transform it into maybe another chance with the reverse splits that are going on for another opportunity at winning. Yeah, obviously, um, once again, uh, reverse reverse grid format. So, yeah, um, we'll see where we, where we could uh, finish up. Obviously, that second race is, um, is where you the, the grids get reversed, obviously. So, yeah, we'll, um, we'll see where we end up in that first race. And, yeah, I'm, I'm confident, um, confident race pace-wise there. So, yeah, I'm hoping for... Hopefully another decent result for all the boys at Trek Sim Sports. Well, confidence is key, but before we let you go, any shout-outs or sponsors? Yeah, I just thank all the sponsors for our team, which are Trick Custom Fabrications and Night Rider Designs. And just a massive, massive thank you to, to Ross Rizzo for, for helping out um, 
during the race. He did did our fuel numbers and was keeping us aware of what was happening. So yeah, just a massive, massive shout out to him. Um, Michael Healy, obviously, he had a good result. Scott Zalowski, Anthony, and um, Marty as well. All the boys at Trick, and yeah, for you guys as well um, for putting on a really classy broadcast. Broadcast, you can say so. Yeah. Well, no worries at all. Forzen Onabi comes home in third position. Fourth place, though, was held by Jake Maloney, standing by with Reese. Yes, indeed. Mr. Maloney, you had one of the standout strategies of the race, pitting very early to start off with, and you came back on pace and on position later on in the race. What happened from your perspective? Um, I sort of... At, I wanted to go to the early pit stop. We were sort of struggling on tyre wear early on and wanted to make some changes to see if we could improve it and sort of just get it clear of the field and try and put down some good laps but um yeah got us clear of the field for a bit um probably didn't um probably wasn't quite quick enough to make that strategy work but um it's all all evened out um in the end about where i was before um with the way the safety car worked out so yeah, um it wasn't turned out to be pretty decent for us yeah, certainly did. And um, from a from a team perspective, I guess TTL Esports, it was a an up and down race for you guys. Obviously, um, your other boys uh, having some trouble there. But it's it's the start of uh, a bit of a, a new chapter, isn't it, for TTL with the signing of Jackson Suslin Harlow and uh, the team in general uh, coming up on some uh, some really good pace in this event. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so it's just been about getting a few new guys um, around the team and sort of pushing the team forward a bit. Um, obviously, Rogers left to Coanda, which um, was a bit of a loss, but also a good thing to see one of your drivers go to the best team in the world. And um, yeah, just keep pushing on. And obviously, between Richard and myself, we've got a fair bit of experience and we've got a few more of the younger and newer ones coming on. So hopefully try and get them up there towards the top 10 and top 5. Yeah, excellent stuff. And uh, into Lagos, are you looking to uh, to pull off something like this again with the reverse grid sprint? Ah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, ho hope to be competitive in the um first race and sort of be up towards the front of the field. But um, if not, we can try and get lucky with the reverse grid and see where we end up with that. But um, yeah, just try and continue on the form that we've had. Here. Well, before we let you go, Mr. Maloney, who would you like to plug? Yeah, just like to say a big thanks to um, SimWorks. We brought them on board this year. Um, great to have a premium simulator brand on board with us this year and um, tire designs for our um, very good looking livery and um, also down under graphics and thank them for everything they do. Awesome stuff. Jake Maloney there, your fourth place finisher. And to cap off our driver interviews for tonight, Mr. Sperry, you're with Mr. Loxton. I certainly am, Brett. Fantastic qualifying, first and foremost. Nobody really had penciled your name down in as someone who could maybe challenge at the amount, the level that you managed to find. But second place in qualifying, a refreshing surprise, I think, for many up and down the grid. Yeah, it's pretty good. I was pretty confident we could get up near the front, but I didn't think I'd be that close to Jared. Well, you certainly were incredibly close. And let's talk the opening laps here for a second, because you had to be aggressive. You had to find yourself fighting and trying to get positions. What happened over the mid to late part of the event that, or, or of the stint, sorry, that really didn't put you in a position to be as aggressive and able to keep the same pace? Oh, I just kept making silly little mistakes and burning up the tyres. Not well, ideal, yourself... but... Sometimes it's the way it goes. Um, but you now find yourself maybe uh, struggling a little bit towards the end of that event. You found yourself with a good opportunity to go out there, to be aggressive, to attack, but ultimately one slowdown penalty and you're pushed over to the back of the pack effectively, trying to find a way past Maloney. How difficult was it to make moves, especially in the final stages of that race? Uh, it's pretty tough because most of the guys, the pace is very similar to each other. So even if you're two or three tenths quicker, it's pretty hard to get past someone. But um, the awkward part was when um, Ian got past me because I got a massive cramp in my right foot and I couldn't get the throttle down smoothly and then unsighted into a corner and got, got the slowdown. Wow. So that pretty much tells anyone who's racing that yeah, sim racers do work hard and they do have to really put in a lot of effort to get through because things like cramps are a thing. But, Brett, before we let you go, any shout-outs or sponsors? 
Yeah, I'd like to thank Zoo for hosting and domains and Kimmy's Rural Fencing. Well, no worries at all. Brett Loxton comes home in fifth position, but that's all we're going to have time for here this evening here on the iRacing Esports Network. But in a couple of weeks' time, we will be back with racing action at Interlagos for the reverse sprint. Three races worth of action. That is going to be absolutely fantastic to get in and watch and make sure you check that out. But also to those who get it done for us here today, Virtual Racing School, the big main sponsor here of the V8 Supercards Online Premier Series, along with West End Mazda, Motum Simulation for the replays that we've been seeing, and of course, Oceanic Sim Racing, who hosts the overall tournament. From here on the Simspeed TV network, it is J. It is Jay Kennedy Kennedy who is behind the cameras. We've got also Reese Gardner here on my right hand side. I've been Jake Sperry. As much as things change, some things still stay the same. The champion's advantage pays off as now they head to the Samba Land as they look to try and find more action, more fun, and ultimately some close quarters combat. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Fantastic. This is GT racing right now. He's got tracks and he's got rhythm. Both of them. Maloney. Oh, he's, he's taking Anderson. Anderson's up the hill. Oh, my God. Oh, that big crash. Oh, my goodness. Oh, the field's going to get rolled. Six very close. These guys are one I want to make their way through the field very quickly. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's massive. Oh, this is it. This is over. I can't believe this. Oh, my oh, God. Oh, my God. What?